So guys, welcome to Speak Up Monday here at Tropical Nomad 630 every Monday. Uh, tonight we've got, I don't know, some of the best bunch of boys, men that, that I've met in a little while. I've just got a good feeling. I feel it. So as you know, uh, Speak Up Monday is about Indonesia. It's called Destination Indonesia. And it really is about some incredible people doing some incredible things here. So those of you watching who are maybe not inside Bali or Indonesia get a really good handle on the, on the types of crazy characters, beautiful, crazy people doing incredible things that you can find here as a way for us to bribe you, without the bribing, just to corrupt you to get here because it's such a good place, you'll have a great time. This is number 202, wow. so 202 episodes, you can find the whole library or the last 100 and so on YouTube, so go to YouTube, Speak Up Monday, you'll find Robert Ian Bonnick before, but just go Speak Up Monday, Speak Up one word, Monday, on YouTube, you'll find it. And also, lastly, Facebook Live. So Facebook group, Speak Up Monday. Speak Up One Word, Monday group on Facebook and also Instagram. But Instagram's more of a bulletin. So my name is Robert, Robert Ian Bonnick. As you know, I'm a tourism architect. So what I do is that uh, I work with tourism boards and also operators to ensure that they get maximize and generate inbound tourism to Bali, right? That's what we do. So, tonight we have Jiwa Community Garden. Now, oh, almost like a round of applause there. It's like, hold a round of applause, not yet. We were close, we were so close. So Jiwa Community Garden, I popped there yesterday with my two daughters. And like, as, as Juka will, will attest to in a moment, it didn't go down well with my daughters. Like, you know, we're in Bali, right? So you want people to be like, man and nature, like tri hita karana, right? Man, environment, right? <laughs> My kids are like somewhere in the middle or not even in the triangle itself. They're still, they're, still getting used to it. they're still getting used to it. It's like, it's so smelly, but incredible things, right? So it's about how to connect human beings to the environment is the way I see what, what you do there and it's phenomenal. They've turned like what was before like kind of like barren wilderness or bush if you're in Australia. Australia is bush and they've created something really special. It's a, it's a beautiful place for people to come, to go, to stay, to socialize, to connect with nature, to learn how to grow, to learn how to feed ourselves organically with sustainability in mind, right? So, now you can go round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got Lenny from Germany. Lenny from Germany. And then we've got Krishna. Now I'm guessing Krishna, you're from Bali. Mm -hmm. Thank God I got that right. <laughs> Just kidding. And then we finally got Juka. Now Juka, where are you from actually? I'm originally Italian. Italian. I'm born here, so a bit of a mix. Got it, beautiful. So look, um, we've got three guys tonight, so it's gonna be interesting to see who, who, who answers the questions. But um, maybe we start with you, Lenny, <laughs> as you're closest to me. So where did the whole concept and idea of Jiwa Community Gardens come from? Um, okay, what's, what's the length of answer you're looking for? <laughs> Whatever's flowing with you right now. Okay, cool. Um, let's, good, let's, do, let's do a little bit of a, um, a time travel back. Um, let's start with Krishna. Krishna um, grew up, grew, is born in, yeah, born and raised here in Bali, and he's he's gonna tell you a little bit more maybe later. But um, running a business here in Changu that is, you know, in the tourism industry, and obviously with COVID hitting the entire world, Bali was hit as well, and so obviously they, they lost about I think what 80, 90 percent of your customers. 90 percent. Yeah, and that that was the we beginning. Still, yeah, we still receive 200 customers per day. Oh, <laughs> two microphones. <laughs> One microphone is not enough. He needs to. We used to receive. Give him a mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so we used to receive 300 customers a day, and then now we're at 30 customers. Hopefully, we'll get more, but this is the reality. Wait, that we're slow down. So, how many customers did you used to receive a day? 300. 300, and now you're down to 30. 30. Yeah. It's a big. It's a big drop. 90 percent. 90 percent. Continue. Uh, yeah, I continue telling Krishna's story. So, <laughs> no, let me let me do that. I have you know, I have a bit of a flow here. So let's. So. And so Christian was okay, you know, lots of customers are falling away, um, lots of staff had to let go. Um, and so obviously one of his intentions, I think, was to find ways how to still support Bali's communities. And at the same time, he's passionate about waste. 
so doing things in an ecological, sustainable way. And um, one of the, you know, I think most in the face things is, you know, trash on the beach, you know, lots of trash just being, being shipped to the landfill, even though a lot of that doesn't have to go there. And so I think Krishna focused on saying, okay, what can, what can I do with my time that obviously I've gained because, you know, the business lost lots of its customers, there's a bit of free time available. Um, so let me take care of the problem that's probably facing, which is managing its waste. And so he started talking to local markets and households and restaurants and says, hey, you know, the first thing we have to do is separate it. If we don't separate our waste, we can't process it. You know, recycling and all that is based on having different types of wastes lined up to find out how we can recycle it, reuse it, turn it into valuable assets, right? And so going to the local markets was the first step in saying, hey, can you please, you know, let's, let's work on a solution how we can separate organic waste from everything else. If it's all mixed up, it goes straight to landfill, producing toxic runoffs and all that that ends up in, you know, rivers and um, groundwater and, and the ocean, obviously, which, you know, no surfer in Bali really wants. Um, and so he started picking up organic waste from the local markets, from households and restaurants, and basically just chucking it in the back of um, Serenity, which is the business he's running. And you know, if you do that for a few weeks, things start to pile up, and you know, the neighbors start complaining, hey, it's, it, it smells, it's, it doesn't look great. Um, so Krishna you know, saw himself faced with, I think, two main issues is he needs more space, and he needs a little bit more knowledge and guidance of how to make proper compost. Because if you do it the right way, it doesn't smell. And it doesn't actually, you know, have to infiltrate, you know, you know, your neighbor's bathrooms and all that, and attracting all those animals. Um, and so, he started reaching out to families and friends that might be able to offer some land. And he also started reaching out to families and friends who can help him with the knowledge aspect. And Juga is the guy with, you know, the knowledge, I would say, and. Gener generously, a, f a family friend of, of Krishna's also had a piece of land that they hadn't really used in quite some time. Um, 20 years. And by chance, Juka and I have been connecting over the past year, just talking about, you know, agriculture projects and community projects, trying to, you know, turn Bali into a bit more of a greener space, especially down here in Changu. There's, there's no parks you can go to. It's very little nature, like right there, where you can, you can, you know, have a little bit of. Green, green things around you, and so we've had, you know, bounced some ideas back and forth about how we can create a space that does that, and it also creates community. And so, you know, all of the, all of those things coming together, kind of gave birth to, yeah, a place where we can turn waste into valuable assets, composting. At the same time, you know, create a place where we can grow things and put, you know, bring communities together. Um, you know, teaching about basics of agriculture, permaculture, and all that. And yeah, we're super lucky to have a, have a piece of land at, of that size and basically, you know, um, the center of Changu Prayer Land. You know, like one of the things which I love about your story, right? And, and just by the way, like just want to give some respect. England slash Jamaica, Germany, right? Bali, Italy slash Bali. Like uh, this is cool. Like, and that one of the things which I love about Bali, right, is that you have this. You know, you have four different religions, five if you include the rest, all working together in a way that everything is harmonized, everything has a, has a space on the calendar and is respected, be you Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and so on, right? So first, I just wanna, I just wanna say, because I'm all about unity, right? Empowering unity and uh, bringing people together of different backgrounds, which is what unity is. Mm -hmm. So when I see the three of you, and we had a, we had a bit of a laugh like, like before, I can see the chemistry, and the energy between all of you, and it's just really cool. Like, it, like, and then being there yesterday as well with, with the kids, who again took it a bit hard. <laughs> the kids took it a bit hard, but I was a bit <laughs> surprised. But then I, I realized that not everybody has this, you know, reaction to gardens, and I think it takes a bit of time. It's okay. Yeah, you know, but but just to see you do that in Changu or very close to it, I think is such a powerful, important thing. And as you mentioned before, you've got some of the biggest schools, Montessori some of the biggest international schools, which you're helping to connect the kids to the environment, which is so phenomenally important because again, where that kind of population, uh, it, we pass on things and our kids do as we do, right? So I better get into nature more so my kids <laughs> become more natureful. But um, so that leads me on to this. Uh, we're here in Bali, obviously, and Tali Hita Kadana is a very important concept that, well, it's not even a concept, it's a practical application of what Bali is. So Krishna, I'm gonna get the microphone to you. So maybe the people here in studio or those watching from different parts of the world, maybe they say, well, Tri Hita Karana, 
what the hell does that mean and why is it important? So maybe it just in, in your own words, uh, just to answer that question. So Trihita Karana is a philosophy on how to respect nature or the importance of respecting nature, respecting other people and respecting a higher being. So it could be God, uh, Sangyang Widi, basically the balance of all three is very important. Now, the good news is, compared to the other islands, in my personal opinion, Bali is doing good. There is high tolerance, there is uh, an importance of eating right, of eating healthy, of, of nature. That's the good news. Uh, the not so good news is, compared to other places in the world, we're not doing so good. And the reason being is that religion is, is very important. When I say religion for Balinese people, and I say this as probably the worst example of someone who's religious, because I'm really not religious, but is that religion is linked deeply into the culture. So when we're talking about religion, we're not talking about religion per se, we're looking about how things are done here. And every day there's a ritual, the, the daily ceremonies that are done. And this is good because it, it connects you with, with nature. But the problem is this ritual becomes more of a robotic gesture. They're doing it as quickly as possible because they even forgot why they're doing it in the first place. There's, there's one thing that I always see that really, it, it just amazes me that people are doing it. When people are doing the offerings, it's full of plastic. You've got candies wrapped in, in plastic. You've got cakes wrapped in plastic. You've got even some flowers wrapped in plastic. And then when you ask them, why do you put plastic around it? It's so they can do it faster, obvious. So I don't have to worry about it. I just buy one time in bulk and just do it. But we're losing the importance of this daily offering. Any, every religion has a certain ritual that you do, right? Christians go to church, uh, Muslims have the, the sholat. But if you're doing it just for the sake of doing it, then what's the point? And this is where we're at in Bali. With religion comes all the tradition that you have to do, especially when you get married, when you're born. There's a need to spend so much money on, on your marriage. And I say this because I just got married two weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago. With crowd, crowd like, <laughs> Two weeks fresh, fresh off the... I, I remember around three months ago in September, we were talking about what kind of wedding we should have. And my family is super not religious, super not traditional. And I had the balls to say, hey, why don't we just skip the whole wedding part? Don't spend any money on the wedding. And we just go to the, the civil, civil service and just get certified for the wedding, wedding certification. And the first words that came out of the mother's mouth was, so you're gonna impregnate my daughter on an accident? And then like, you know? So it was, it was a really bad thing. But I just thought, man, if you just go to the civil service, it's, it costs maybe five million. The wedding costs so much more money. And what happens after the wedding, right? No one talks about the after wedding, is that you are scraped financially that you are forced, you are forced to focus on making money after your marriage. And this is what happens to every couple that gets married, especially in Bali. How can you focus on saving the environment when you are so strapped for cash that all you can think about is how you make more money? So when you have an investor come, one who's sustainable but maybe will give you less money, but one will give you lots of money but scraps the whole environment, like, who do you go for? You go for the one that gives you the most money. So it's, it's rooted in this problem that Trihita Karana is a philosophy, but applying is, is much more tough. So that's, that's where hopefully Jiwa comes in. Um, personally, no, 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 think about it. Because Jiwa is, is still a business model, but we're trying to be sustainable at the same time. I don't believe there's a solution that will be both make lots of money and save the environment, but this is the, the fine balance, the fine balance. You, you know what, that's a brilliant answer, like uh, really, because not that, again, here we don't 
We don't script anything. These questions just come and we ask and we go from there, right? Follow the energy through. But that's the first time I've heard anyone discuss it and bring that up in that way. Because, yeah, it's something which I've actually never really thought about, even with the offerings, mm. right? But it's so true. So on the what, because, I mean, for those people who are maybe not here in the audience, but those watching, so Bali is going through an incredible time. As you mentioned before, with the situation that it is, things have had to change. Mm. And you know, one of the things which I focus on doing, one of the things is that it's about this, not new Bali, but uh, a new dimension to Bali, which is this influx. And this is, it's about supporting it, engaging it, and where possible, uh, creating and generating it, right? Which is more of a culturally aware person and it's the startups, the incubators, the blockchain, the sustainability. So all of these things kind of coalesce to create a Bali which has a, has a different future in perspective to sustainability mm. and these important things that we're going to discuss tonight. So again, hearing you say that, mm. that goes into my mind and I think, wow. It's down to that level. And obviously, we've got people, I mean, Janur, um, Plastic Exchange is a close friend, been on the show, I think, three, three times, right? And, you know, as you mentioned, it's about changing habits from I take the plastic. I mean, some religions, right? Some monotheistic religions is about, it's all about the afterlife. Right, it's like, hey, listen, you know, like this is just, uh, this is just like a, I'm passing through, yeah. so I can just drop this stuff everywhere because, hey, this here doesn't matter. It's the next life that's important. I'll just keep on littering and doing all this stuff. He brought that one up, yeah. but, but the, again, the, the, the essence of it is, you know, like how can we then, you know, change people's habits, right, to then create. It sounds a bit like a cliche, but a better world, right? And it comes into joking around with the daughters, taking them to places. That's part of what attracted us to do it, is to right, try to expose them at such a young age yeah. to as many different experiences as possible. But, but coming to you, Juka, so as boys mentioned before, you know, there's, there's a specific um, skill, attribute, um, passion that you bring to this project. So if I asked you what would that be, what would you say? <laughs> Set up. I know. Look at uh, He's like, oh man. He's like, this is like, oh man. I, Me? <laughs> I mean, I, w I was always very interested in this pattern of, of nature. It was kind of my, I don't know, something I loved following since a child. I used to surf so much, go to the mountains, and just, I, I spent very little time in school when I was a kid, so I spent a lot of time outside. And most of the time was in, yeah, nature, in rice fields, at the beach, up in the hills, and, and I tended to kind of, I fell in love with this whole way it was. Bali was quite a dream growing up, you know, and by the time I was 15, it was shockingly clear that something is changing at a speed that is a bit too unacceptable for me, someone who grew up here, and possibly somebody that had both worlds, you know. I grew up with a Western mother and a Balinese upbringing, family and all that. So I did see that something was like, wait a minute, we're going so far towards building a new Bali where there's just so much more traffic, so much less space, so much less nature. Our water systems are being cut, our soil is being degraded. And I'm like this kid trying to understand where are we going, what direction. So I. Um, so I started to pay a bit more attention to that, and I thought it might have been quite interesting as a kid that didn't have to go to school all the time to focus more on natural buildings and all these things as I was growing up. And so, yeah, I, uh, I got very, uh, I guess, I picked up on all the natural things, and I ended up learning from some of the best teachers on that, I think, in the past 10 years. Um, uh, teachers who were teaching permaculture, regenerative agriculture, Balinese farming, all, all sorts of farming uh, here in Bali. And last year, I finally got a pretty, I felt confident that I could use this knowledge, this understanding of all the worlds that have been put through, whether it was my Western side, the local side, and. Indonesia isn't just one local thing, it's thousands of islands, and I did live in many of those islands, I did travel Indonesia quite a lot, and so I thought, these, these are knowledges and skills and 
understandings that maybe not every person in the world has. You know, not not every Italian kid born in Bali, raised without school, learning nature has these sets of skills. So I thought it's quite a privilege, definitely, and quite um, quite an an awesome you know upbringing. I thought I definitely want to be that special key that can help unlock lots of systems. Whether it was translating Western projects with local people, making sure that there's no miscommunication, and understanding local culture more than language. Yeah, cu local culture. You can ask anybody. In tomorrow doesn't mean tomorrow. Yesterday didn't mean yesterday. Indonesian has many secret languages, whether it's just the way you say things. And, and Westerners don't know that yet. You could be living here for 10 years, and you're speaking literally, and the other person just doesn't understand you, because it's a cultural thing, right? So the first time I noticed that, I was like, shit, this is, I, know, I know exactly what's wrong with this massive miscommunication. It's just, it's not language, it's culture. It's, and <clears throat> so I did that for a few years. And then when Chris said, hey, I, uh, I might need some help with some composting. And I was like, well, yeah, I love compost. You know, what can I do? <laughs> this is like, you know, I, I have a, a proper fetish. With <laughs> yes, he yeah. used the word fetish. We're talking about composting, and Juk used that, the word the, fetish. Just that, was, that was just to show how, how excessively in, into compost I get. That's how passionate he is. And so, um, long story short, I, when he told me, yeah, I, I want to, you know, make a lot of compost. I want to turn Changu, and and the word Changu for me is, I grew up in Changu. I went to school when I was really young in Changu. I, I was uh, surfing Changu breaks when I was a kid, and and you know, when he says like, I'd like to, you know, deal with the waste problem in Changu, I was like, yo, we need this so bad, it's not even funny. Like, there's nothing. I, I how can I get involved? And uh, I was already talking to Lenny at the time, and so. The way I could help was because I understand how to make compost in many different ways, and I kind of understand natural patterns, and so I thought, hey, that could be my best bet at helping this project out, oh. making sure that whatever system we implement at this garden, which is a big space yeah. to have in Changu, it's a value that you know it's hard to put into numbers. It's such an incredible spot. Maybe around three million dollars. Three million dollars. Yeah, okay. yeah. The number man. Uh -huh. So it's a very expensive land that this family, thank God, doesn't need. Yeah. You you can see the the, the, the connection, the right? The dreamer. The number man. The number man. I the, the German. We couldn't do. Specialist. We could. We couldn't do one thing without each. Other. I swear to God, if if I if yeah. if Chris was like, can you just put these numbers together? I'd be like. <laughs> Why are you asking me this? So I, I rely on, on them a lot. Um, and so then my, my, my biggest contribution, I would say, is yeah, maybe just being able to translate natural systems to the people who might not understand these systems, right? You know, like that's such a, that's such a powerful thing because uh, I love this, this view and this understanding about, like it's beneath about here if you're watching. By the way, if you watch on YouTube, it's probably the best one because Instagram Live, the microphone for Instagram Live is here and you might not hear everybody, but YouTube, just go to Speak Up Monday, Speak Up One Word Monday on YouTube and you'll have a much better experience. But unity and diversity is binika tungul ika, right? So the unity and diversity. Oh, so okay. yeah, that, that's, that, that's it. And, and Destination Indonesia, people inspire people. So these are the three things that we stand for. And really quick, so I grew up only black kid uh, at school for the first 13 years. I thought I was a white kid in, in a black man's body. Go figure, it's a bit crazy. But here's the thing, <laughs> it's a bit crazy, it's true, it's true. But here's the thing, like what I learned, because I'm all about unity, right? My, and I have a very powerful mission about unifying and uh, anyway, that's not, not another story. But the thing is this, I understand both I understand at that time a Caucasian perspective, and later on I, I, I realized I was actually a black guy with, with a Jamaican history and all the rest of that. But I was able to put the two together and unite the best of both. And so it's called being a bridge. Yes. So how I see you is exactly the same way to something that is extremely important now about connecting people to the environment. But as you said, like, as you said, right, with Tulihi uh, Tekadana, you know, like, it's interesting because I come from the outside in. Right, yeah, these, these ones will, will, be, will, they'll, they'll be for a little while. Maybe it's going to rain some, soon. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we get some wind to, to take these guys out. But anyway, we'll work it out. So, but yeah, so to get your view on Tri Karana and to get your view on like the differences so subtle in the way that things are said and spoken. I, I, I speak Italian fluently, right? 
and I learned Italian grammar. So I get what you mean about, you know, in Italian there's like four or five different pasts. Immediate, yesterday, last week, a year ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, all different words. So, I, and it's so subtle. Yeah, here we don't have, not even yesterday. So yeah. there is no past or future. So you can imagine the, right, the, yeah. how hard it is for some people to communicate sometimes. So. Far out. So, so then Lenny, like coming here from Germany, right? So what, in what you do now, sustainability and obviously GWA Gardens, what were some of the biggest challenges for you personally to overcome if you overcame them, right? If you're still working on them, that's okay. In getting GWA up and running and just the cultural challenges or differences, what comes up for you? Um, interesting. So the first time that we had, that we invited people over to the side to GWA Community Garden is I think it's going to be exactly a year ago on the 6th of December. And we had a friend of ours come and bring his camera and kind of, you know, do a bit of a documentary and interview us. And he exactly asked that question, like, hey, how do you guys, what are the potential challenges? And like, what are, what's the chance that this is going to fail? Or what are your biggest fears? And I remember watching those interviews back maybe like three months ago, which is super interesting. Because obviously, you know, we're still alive. We're still running the project. It's actually, you know, it, it actually worked out pr pretty well, I would say. Um, and like, yeah, one of the, the biggest goals and challenges that we had was obviously, you know, we just talked about, you know, unity and diversity. And sometimes I think in, in Changu, that's missing. We have a lot of places that are very targeted towards people that come from the outside of, of Bali or of Indonesia. Um, and, you know, I think especially for these two growing up here, it's, it's a shame to see so much you know, so much distance between what locals do and think and what they spend their time on and what expats do, you know, when they come from, from outside of Indonesia. And so for us, it was, you know, a very, very important aspect to build a place that offers, you know, something to both of those groups, people that are from here and people that are not from here. And, you know, obviously there's a few people in between that, but it was for us important to have a mission and put those things into practice that is inviting for Indonesians. You know, if it's a Gojek driver that, let's say, earns, you know, two, three million, two million, two, you know, three million rupee a month, or someone that is, you know, very wealthy coming from, from the outside, but is interested in learning about permaculture. So if you come to Jiwa Garden, you want to drink a coffee, it's not going to break the bank. Um, but at the same time, you know, you ha we have things that obviously offer something to people that do come from a very, let's say, privileged perspective, but do want to get back to simplicity and see how they can connect with local people, with nature. Because I think especially COVID kind of woke a lot of people up and say, hey, what do I actually really want? What's really important for me? You know, if traveling is not possible, if, you know, maybe I have less money than before, you know, food becomes something that is so much more important. And I think one of the other aspects is feeling connected, feeling connected to other people around us. And so building a place that has community and that's community driven was a big challenge. And I think that's one of the ones that, you know, I think we're still working on it, but we're overcoming it step by step. Um, Love to help you in, in any way I can. Just put it put it out there. Yeah, yeah, awesome. I mean, this is I think this is one of one of the things where, yeah, it, the more we can put out what we're doing, and I think the more you know, the more ears and eyes we reach, I think the better we can we can bridge that. Exactly what you talked about, you know, building building bridges. Love it, man. And then uh, to Krishna, right? Because you you brought it up, and thank you for speaking your, your truth. You know, like so. There are expats who come here, like the guys in the audience, like me, and a few other people I'm sure who'll be watching. And, you know, we, we, so let's say we come here, right, and we want to do good, right? We want to be involved in good projects. We want to have good thoughts. We want to have good deeds, right? We want to follow, follow that through. But we don't know, right? We, we only know what we know. And quite often that's not localized. <laughs> so what we think is, is, is the polite way to do it might be rude to someone who lives here, but we think we're being polite, but you're not, right? So if there were maybe three things that you've noticed, you know, the expats who you feel in your heart want to do the right thing, want to do good, which three mistakes did they make? And then... Right after that, it's like if people are going like, oh, many, right? So three mistakes that they make. We're giving them time to think about it, by the way. So three mistakes that they make, and like maybe you know, like what are three things that they could do? 
because you've got both your bridge as well. By the way, all three of your bridges. Um, but you're a bridge too, because I, I can see that you've got one foot in the uh, expat mentality. Uh, the way you speak, the way you phrase yourself, the way you hold yourself, the way you are, I, I get it, right? And, ser and serendipity, I, I get where that is as well. It just hit me. But anyway, um, enough time to give you th time to think. <laughs> So how, how would you answer that one? So if, if I understand the question, it's three things that, that like mistakes yeah. that, that, three. New, that newcomers do? Correct. But remember, we're talking about people who want to do good. Want to do good. We want to do good. Like the, in their heart, when you look at a person and you feel their energy, you know this person just wants to do good, but they just keep screwing it up, right? So, so what are the three main mistakes do you think that people coming here, because people, uh, this is about Destination Indonesia, right? So people mm. are watching this, coming to Bali, remote workers, all the rest of that, and they want to do good. So we're trying to help them to localize before they come, which then makes the life of, of, of everybody here better. Yeah, makes sense now? Three mistakes and then three... It's, just, it's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard question. Of course it is. Because we're talking about helping local the local community, local people, but even with local people, we don't even agree with each other. So it's like, who, like how, you know? Honesty, you love it. <sighs> it's a tough one. I, I pick, pick the generalization, right? So I know in your mind the complexity mm. is a lot deeper than what I, I acknowledge by asking the question. So, so maybe just go generalistic, generalistic. Now, what three tips? Mm -hmm. There you go. He, see, what the, see how they work mm -hmm. together? Yeah. See, this is the team right here. Love it. So think about it. It's coming. <coughs> I can see it. So, okay. So the first, the first thing I would suggest is don't try to change everything. Just start small. And when I say start small, think about the little things that you can change. Uh, Waste separation at the source is, is so important. It's, it's incredibly, it helps Bali. So when you have three rubbish bins instead of just one, that is already the first step. Like literally that's the, really the first step. The second thing is in terms of your waste. You think about your waste, no one thinks about the leaves and branches. So think about where you're throwing your leaves and branches. And the last one, don't try to use all your space, your building space, for the building. I mean, think, think about this, right? Changu was a rice field. And, and, and you're saying that you know, we're coming here, we're going to build a beautiful villa. And I'm guilty of this. My family is guilty of this, too. When, I was, when we started in 98, built, there was no neighbors. And so we built all across our buildings because to north, south, east, west, it was just rice fields, so beautiful rice fields. What happens the next year? A few meters away, there's a villa that's being built. Same thing, they completely fill the space. That's okay because there's still a rice field between the villas, so you have a nice view. Two, three years later, a villa is just right in between the two villas. <laughs> so now you don't have any rice field, you're just villa, villa, villa. And that's how you have kuta. That's how Kuta was built. And now Kuta is dead. And humans have this incredible power of destroying beautiful things. I'm so, it's just true. Nature is just beautiful at, at, in itself. When you create a building there, sure, in the beginning you have all this energy and you, you fill it with full of people, but one day the energy dies or something happens, COVID happens, and now it's an empty building. And this empty building will never be truly beautiful. So that's, that's uh, if I would say that, that, but the first two things literally cost almost zero money. If you cannot afford a second and third bin, get a, a something else, like a, a, a random plastic bag or something. Just, just anything, just hold the plastic and paper and the compost. Uh, and you won't realize how important that is. I mean, I, I grew up in, in Sunrise School, so I, this is my childhood friend. We went to school together. Yeah, we went to school together. About I always thought about composting and waste separation when I was a kid. Wow. And I went through depression from 15 until I was 21 years old because I realized that I wasn't normal. I wasn't a kid that, you know, 
all my friends just did not separate their waste or think about nature or composting. So I, literally depressed. I was I, no, not Medicaid or anything, but I was really <laughs> sad. I don't know how to explain that. Like, you grew up in a world, and then you realized that this is not the reality. I thought Indonesia was Bali. The first time I went to Jakarta when I was 15 years old, Jakarta, the capital, I thought Jakarta was another Bali. It was another country. I was walking Jakarta like this. People were looking at me funny, and I was like, that's a weird way to greet people. You know, they were like, whoa, you know? So the, the first two things, please, that's like literally the two most important things. And you're thinking like, oh, that's so simple. What, waste separation and don't throw your leaves and branches? Before the beginning of Jiwa, like I would say six months before, I was really, I had this, all this energy to give. And I was doing these webinars and I was talking in Jakarta online webinars with 100, 200 people to talk about the environment. I was one of the chairpersons for World Cleanup Day this year. So talking a lot. And at the end of every speech, I would always try to say like, okay, who's gonna start waste separation? You know, they were like, oh no, no. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand waste separation. I can't do it. And that's, uh, I guess when I guess I started working towards more local solutions and then the GY idea came to mind with Juka and Lenny. Because after a while you just get tired of just talking to so many people and when you ask them like okay can you do something about it they're like oh no no oh it's too much too much effort so those three things i think yeah. thank you brother yeah. you know yeah, yeah. round of applause <laughs> like it, it's interesting because you know again i don't make up the questions i come in and i ask them but a lot of the time they're phrased in a different way i guess than usual mm. because this show is about going deep you know, it's not really a surface level conversation. We have a laugh and we joke around and that's great, but we also go deep because, you know, like it's an hour and a half, an hour, whatever it is, and you want people to feel you, right? Otherwise, if they don't get you, then what's the point, right? And, and I'm getting all of you actually, so, but I really appreciate you taking the time. And even when you're stuck, it's okay, yeah. it, you know, because it, like, Okay, there's a, there's a clock, right, which is, uh, okay, so 12, 1 to 12. 12 till 1 is this is what I know that I know, my name, where I'm from, all the rest of that. 1 till, say, 2 or 3 are the things that I know that I don't know, right? I, know, I, don't, I don't know how the rocket goes up to space, blah, 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 blah. I know it does, but I don't know how it does. 3 to 12 is the things that I don't know that I don't know. And this is the subconscious stuff that we don't often look at. And it comes up in moments like this, mm. things we don't really think about often, mm. but they're under there and they're running stuff. So when these things come up, it's really cool because then you get something. These guys are getting value anyway because you, you're great guys, mm. right? But the, the way this works is that I want you to get value too. So there's things that get stirred up within you that over the next few days, you're like thinking, you know, like, wow, like what that question, what, what, do, I, what do I believe in? What am I passionate about? Like, why am I doing this? And this also helps to reunite us if we need to with our purpose. And it empowers us and people get to see who you really are. Because before they know you already, they think they do, yeah. but then now they're looking and think, shit, I didn't realize that the Jukka went through depression. I didn't really know, oh, sorry, not Jukka, but, but Krishna, excuse me. The Jukka probably did as well. Anyway, <laughs> didn't hear it from Trista. me. <laughs> sorry, man, he said not to talk about that. But sorry. it's a good point because if you ask that question to Lenny or Jukka, they'd have completely different answers. Yeah. I would say Lenny would be the more positive one. He like, he's optimist about life. He's like, oh yes, we'll get it done. That means that yeah. I'm definitely the most <laughs> negative. <laughs> Mamma mia. But, but, but you know what, Juka, uh, over to you, I love that. Len Lenny, 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 Lenny's like, listen, man, I want to talk. I want to talk. talk. Um, so Juka, uh, when it comes to you, so like, the, again, on this topic of people coming to Indonesia, coming to Bali, right, um, what would you say are the three biggest challenges facing Bali right now in terms of what Jiwa is here to do? Oh, my God. So, so as a, in general, but with the fact that other people would be coming from outside? Yeah, so um, it's going to sound like, uh, like um, I can't even think of the word, but it's going to sound like, like I'm going against what I just said, right? Right, right, right? Like a malaprop or something. But part of what we do here isn't necessarily about 
answering the question. It's what's triggered within you. Right. So whatever's triggered within you is what's supposed to come out. I, I mean, there's obviously so many quite big problems that we're facing, and the one that we tend to tackle head on at Jiwa, or the ones that I tend to deal with every day, and Lenny and Krish, is um, it seems to be, yes, one of them is waste. And that's clear. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter if you don't speak the language, doesn't matter if you're a young or an adult, you come to Bali and you clearly notice that there's a waste problem, especially during the rainy season. Um, in fact, there is insane amount of work being done to help that. There's the Sungai Watch and you know, big shout out to them that are trying so hard to make sure that governments, locals, communities are aware of this stuff, first of all. Like, just being aware of it, because like Chris said about the people offering with plastic and you know, wrappers and they bag their offerings in plastic and then they throw it off. They are obviously not m malintended. They don't want to just trash the island. Nobody explained what this stuff is. Mm. This is just the truth. Like, no government ad ever was like, hey, that stuff's not good. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, don't feed turtles with plastic. And, yeah, we go to the to the beach every six months and do a pretty big ceremony about nature. And we go, you know, respecting Mother Nature and, and, and the ocean. And there is an insane amount of trash that gets done right at the sort. Like, at the moment we give the, the offering, that's where we trash it. Like, there's plastic everywhere. So it's just, it's hypocritical because we don't know, right? So um, in Bali, there's a lack of awareness of what this plastic does. So this is one of the biggest issues. And I think... I think we're actually, for the first time in my life, as I grew up, I feel there's like a grain of hope because I see so many motivated people doing it. Sometimes I do turn a corner in the middle of nowhere and I just see people burning plastic and that's when I'm like, oh my God, never mind, you know, take that hope away. But there are moments where I do go like, holy cow, there's that many people that are actually talking about it. There's the local government starting to change the gear on this. So that's a massive one. And I do see that if every person in Bali can just understand that, you know, it's not the locals are throwing trash, the businesses are throwing trash. Locals were never taught of what this stuff is, like the ones that might have not had the exposure to, you know, uh, the, the understanding of plastic. And so we can't point fingers, but we just have to bring the, the knowledge out there and show by example. And that's something that we do. Um, and then, the, 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 probably the biggest one is, well, they're all very important, but uh, agriculture. Agriculture, 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 and agriculture. We, 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 we focus so much on so many different things re regarding agriculture, whether it's the technology, whether it's the water, whether it's the seeds, and how do we do this. Uh, we're just going further and further from <laughs> what it actually is. Agriculture is just growing food on nature. It's not in a spaceship, though we're getting there soon. Um, and by doing so, we have depleted every possible inch of our soil of its properties, you know, whether it's all the nutrients, whether it's the soil itself. We lose topsoil by the, you know, by the millions of hectares every day, just like there they go, every rain, uh, every year. Um, and so understanding that we cannot go this way uh, any longer. This is not something that sustains anybody. Uh, it's something that will just get worse. So we tend to reach out to farmers. We work with farmers. We work with local communities to say, hey, just pay attention to the ground. Just, just look at the dirt that you're stepping on and understand that it's one of the most complex and f mind blowing things. You know, it's just mind blowing. You could never imagine what goes on down there. And thank God to some scientists that actually take it out and, like, holy cow, what's in there? There's mushrooms, there's all these things. And so they've taught us these things, and now we can share it. Um, even though most ancient wisdoms knew this already. Yeah, so we've had a, a phase of forgetfulness, and now we're learning it again. Um, so working with local farmers is just, you know, at the top. And that doesn't mean like, oh my God, poor local farmers, what are we going to do to save their crops? It's deeper than that. It's, first of all, all our farmers are 60 and above. Yeah. On the, on the, on the age, it's like, what are they? 60 and above, right? 50. Mm, yeah, 60 and above, yeah. So no farmers under 60, pretty much. The, there's like an, a tiny percent. So we don't want to focus on the 60 and above year old farmers because 
by the time they are gone, yeah, they're gonna be we dead soon. don't have <laughs> we don't have the new generation. In fact, 40 and above is already too young, uh, too old. Yeah. We gotta go down to the 20s and possibly before the 20s. If we can get to the generation that will actually be living in the technology, right? Like. We are already getting overpassed by the technology. I'm about to turn 30, and it's like I haven't. And so, as a 20-year-old farmer, you got to learn how to run your business as a farmer. You got to learn how to distribute all the new technologies that will be coming out, without destroying your freaking landscape, without destroying your own home, your water system, your air. Right. So, how do we get this message across, without being like the old knower and the old, you know? So there's a lot of crucial points that we have to uh, focus on. So yeah, that's one of the biggest ones. Uh, and I, I know pointed out too, but for me, those are probably two of the biggest things. Thank you for sharing, brother. And look, by the way, just want to thank everyone who's come. Remember, you can always come in the audience if you're watching. And we will give the microphone to you, so you will have a chance to ask, ask your questions if you have any. Make, maybe make a, a mental note if you do have questions. So um, thank you for that. And it brought up, it brought up a few things, right? So. People coming here, right? We've been through you know, three great things, right? That they can do or mistakes that they're gonna make. We've spoken about, and I love your passion, all of you. I connect with it, right? And, and I get you know, that the, your heart is right there. And everyone else here already knows you, but those watching get it too. So Lenny, maybe, maybe to you, brother, like, you know, like what is it people can do now? And, um, or what steps can people take now, we've spoken about sorting trash and sorting this and sorting that. So this is not that anymore, right? Let's move past that for a second. So looking into the future, maybe at the use of technology. You brought up technology before. Um, you spoke about the farmers being 16 and above, and I know the focus is becoming younger, the next generation, right? So, so what things can we do or maybe government? Like, what are the solutions, I know it's very simplistically minded for me, but what are some of the solutions that we watching can participate in that hasn't been mentioned before? Um, how would you answer that? Great question. Um, I would like to go back to, actually, okay, let's not, you know, technology or that aside. I think yeah. you talked about people that come here, they want to do good. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are happening all over the world. People are doing great things and, you know, and there's different things that work in different places. And I think one of the mistakes that people do, or pe you know, one of the things that people don't pay enough attention to is to listen. And like really just spend some time here and see really what's happening, get to understand the culture, get to really hear people out, um, and take your time before you start implementing things and just start running the rat race of trying to change things. We don't actually really know what you're changing until you know what your environment looks like. That's one of the things, definitely. Just really actively listen and take your time to observe your environment, really understand the people, and then see what solutions may potentially work for them and what may actually only work for you because you've seen it somewhere else. Um, and then second of all, I think what Juka just touched on in terms of you know agriculture and land use and destroying nature and not knowing how to separate waste and, and yeah, doing all of that. I mean, we're talking about big, big, big systems changes. It's not just, okay, you know, separate, separate your ways and everything's going to be great. Um, it's so much more that we, especially everybody, we're all, we're all consumers. We're not all solution providers, but we're all consumers. And so really to focus on what you spend your money on. Really put your money where your mouth is. If you want to support local farmers and you don't agree with the way that massive scale agriculture does things because it's destroying the environment, really look at where do you put your money, where do you buy your things from? Is it local? Is it, you know, what does the supply chain look like? Who's actually getting what cut out of what you're paying for it? And I think that's something to like really, really just take, take, a, take a good step back and see what you're consuming on a daily basis because that's what you're supporting. Um, and it doesn't matter with how much or what amount you're spending on it, but whenever you spend a single cent or whatever, you're supporting the practices of that industry. And I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of us can take, myself included, can take a better look at and really say, okay, is this a system that I want to support? Do I want to support you know, farmers making a shitty wage? Or do I want to support farmers making a better wage and it's worth for them to preserve their land? Mm. And in terms of yeah, technology and all that, that's, that's super important, 
but I think it starts way, way, way before that. It's really about you know going back to what the mindset is like because that's the only way we can really change systems. I think the implementations and technologies is is a means to get there, but to really understand where you want to get is the first step. Thank you. Beautiful answers, brothers. You know, you see, like that's a thing, right? So that you like. You work together every day, but there's still things about each other that you don't realize. This is part of it, right? It's beautiful, I love it, right? For those of you watching here, remember, if you're watching on Instagram over here, this microphone, uh, YouTube, speak up one word, Monday, just search for that. It'll be Robert, Robert Ian Bonnick first, but search for that, and that will give you a much better listening uh, experience. The cat's in the background, it's normal. <laughs> so, um, so to you, Brother Krishna, you know, which, because I'm a big believer in, as I mentioned, unity, but also about strategic partnerships. Because, you know, like what we can achieve by ourselves is one thing, and it's very important that we do it, right? But if we want to drive the impact through as quickly as possible, not too fast, but as quickly as to maximize time, yeah. right? Then, you know, it, it's not a rocket scientist viewpoint that if you collaborate with other people, you can, as long as they're aligned on the mission and the journey, you can move faster, right? And get to more people quicker. So if there were any kind of strategic partnerships for GWA, because people might be looking now and saying, well, I love the three guys, they're all characters, right? They're very passionate about what they do for different reasons. They're three different people, unity and diversity, coming together for a joint collective, right? And they love what they do, we can see they're passionate and I wanna help them, right? So, so then what kind of strategic partnerships would you look for or would you like to see, and this, if you've got other ideas, feel free to share, um, that would really help Jiwa Community Garden and the whole movement, which Jiwa is part of a bigger organism, bigger ecosystem. So what sort of strategic partnerships do you think would really help you? Yeah, I was going to say that if you ask each of us, they'll have different answers. Yeah, that's good. Each, each of you answer. Yeah. So I, when it comes to, to Jiwa, my mindset is always how can we make this the best business model ever. Because I've, I've tried the whole, hey, let's save the environment for the sake of the environment, especially with, with local people, it doesn't work. They, and it's not a bad thing, it's just that there's certain priorities that it's more important. Money, family, and religion, right? That's the most, right? Yeah. So, I'm not sure if you get that, right? Did everyone get that? It's like money, money, family, money, family, money, family, and religion. Yeah. I mean, how many families have been broken up because of money in Bali? It's just crazy. Anyway. So, but, but just to, dwell, just to dwell, <laughs> dwell upon it for a second, you know, uh, Adrian, come and grab a seat, brother. Hey, so, Adrian. Adrian Keat is here. He was here on a few weeks ago, last week. Yeah. Love him. So, here's the thing, right? So, what I think a lot of people miss is that the model itself has to be sustainable. Yes. So it needs to make or generate currency of some persuasion. Mm. If we call it money, we call it money or barter, whatever it is, to pay the people or to reward the people with goods and services that help them in their life. Mm. We speak about currency right now, that's fine, but it needs to be, so it's so important actually that it needs to be sustainable. There's a lady, Margaret Barry, who's the founder of Bali Children's Foundation. Mm. Thank you, uh, with Jerome great woman and I, I work with the Tamora group right been GM there for a while uh, consulting and um, oh we lost the camera itchy uh, guys um, uh, Bella gone. Bella lost the camera lost the camera <laughs> yeah no 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 view yeah yeah so so yeah. just just making sure we're still on. just make sure that we're still on we just lost a lost a yeah. okay cool cool we're still on so okay what she taught me because we we're talking about foundations and how can we create a charity. And she's saying, look, Rob, wait, stop. The charity, it starts with creating a business model that works, that throws off excess mm. currency in this case. Yeah. And with that currency is then how you can create a real charity that can be a foundation that is self-sustaining and can go on into the future and beyond. Yeah. That's what you need to focus on. And that wasn't really the answer that I expected. Right. I thought it was going to be the answer that we get fed, right? Oh, if it, you know, it's a good cause, people will support it. Right. Go right. out there and do yeah. it. Yeah. It's not how it works. So just want to 
and bring that one in back, mm. back to back to your, no, no, your I answer. mean that, that's the point, right? I mean, um, how many how many nonprofit organizations really struggled during COVID because their entire income was donations? They never had a backup plan, and we don't we don't judge them. We just didn't want to be in that position. We didn't want to be in a position where we had to always ask for donations. And so it was really, especially for me, from the business perspective, that we were cash flow positive within, what, eight months? Which for any business, Woo-hoo! that's amazing. Round of applause, eight you know? months, cash flow positive. The number, man. <laughs> Have you got space for any shareholders? I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's really amazing. During COVID times, we haven't, of course, our return investment hasn't come in yet. Of course, we're still in the, in the minus, but cash flow positive to be achieving, that's amazing. So I guess what we would, would be really open to, to partnerships would be to business people, people who could help us to make the business model even better. Because if we can convince the business people, then all the Balinese people would just come along. They'd be like, oh, I love the idea. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. So I, <laughs> I honestly think if we have some people who are, who are good at creating business models to evaluate what we're doing and to give us advice how we can financially improve, then we would love to see that our business model either copied, duplicated. It's, it's a viable business. It's, in my, you know, it's the anti-COVID. COVID created three things. Uh, waste, always, no matter what. By the way, Tourism was not the main cause of waste because there's still waste happening in Bali. It's not like waste just disappeared. It's still there. Second was unemployment and people, the third one was people got sick and died. So Jiwa, in, and I say this, my, I'll say my personal opinion so then Lenny and Juka don't get sued or something. I would say Jiwa is the solution to all that. It's the solution to the waste. Imagine having a little community garden next to all the main waste centers or the, the markets or the, you know, the main hotels. The second one is employment. We're employing people, part-timers. We even have now two full-timers. And the last one is for people who are, okay, if they're dead, we can't, we can't help that, right? <laughs> but if they're sick or depressed, rather than staying at home, they're actually going out there and, and growing things. Well, healthy food. Healthy food, of healthy course, air, right? Healthy water. But think about... Like, my personal source of depression when it happened was because I, I didn't know how to help or nothing happened, nothing grew. But a plant grows and it will die, all, it will die, but it will also grow again, right? One seed so will turn into many That would seeds. be from my personal opinion uh, in terms of partnerships. How can we make the Jiwa business model? And we don't even care about the name. It could be... It could be the Robert business model. The Robert community, we, we, don't, we, we, we don't mind, right? I mean. Which, by the way, that, that's how we got the name, because the land is, is heritage land, and there's seven uncles, and their father was a famous farmer in Changu whose name is I Madejiwa. So I truly believe the reason they said yes to the idea was because I said, this land has been unused for 20 years. Your grandpa, I Madejiwa, would have been so sad to see this piece of land unused. Let's dedicate this land to Pak Jiwa, and let's call it Jiwa Community Garden. I love that. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Mamma mia. You, you, know, you know, like, you have such a great way to describe things, right? It's like, now, please take this in, in, in a way that it's intended. Like, so you can talk about some of the most darkest things, but you could just end up laughing. Right? Because he's just so straight. You're like, did he just say that? <laughs> it, it bypasses your logical reasoning capacity to go straight in. You're like, did he just, I'm laughing, but did he just say that? I love it. You know, and just interestingly enough, on, this, on the, the mental health thing, so slightly more serious, but Speak Up Monday, one of the main reasons why Speak Up Monday started was because in Sydney, where I spent many years in the hospitality industry, a high level, three people that I knew no one ever saw it coming. Look good, smell good, all the rest of that. The dogs, the cats, the the the, the, the white picket fence committed suicide, but no one saw it coming over the space of a year. And it was on a Monday, 
that they all did it. And a bit more research, Monday is the most popular day for that to happen. So the idea was like, hey, let's create a ripple, drop a stone, you know, positive waves on a day where other people are doing other things, right? So, so that, so I connect with that, right? And, and um, the thing which came up when you said like that, so have you met Adrian Keat? So, you're right there, right? Right. So Adrian is right there. He, listen, man, I'm just putting you straight in it, live on camera. Like, he would be the perfect guy because he has got business coming out of his da-da-da-da-da, right? Very smart. And he is like, um, yeah, what I call like an impact entrepreneur, but social impact entrepreneur, sustainability, business technology, Fascinating mind, incredible guy. You got to talk to him. So there's no reason, there's no coincidences why he just walked in late, right? Um, you guys should connect, and I'm happy to connect you. But he, you see him there, Adrian. Put your hand up. We, we. Right, awesome guy. Thank you. Awesome guy. So back to the question. So thank you for that. So strategic partnerships, and you said business, mm. right? Who can help you to refine the model mm. to make it even more cash positive and effective because then you can do more, right? Okay, so same question to you, my brother. Whoa. Strategic partnership. Yeah. Um, I, I guess there is a, there is a, a, a bureaucratic side to this. Yeah. A, power side to this in the sense that you, we have to work collaboratively, we have to work as a community, and local governments are part of that community. So we, we've we always, I mean, we know that this is how it works. You, We wouldn't even be able to do what we're doing if the local government didn't kind of accept it, right? Or didn't see it as, you know, okay. If they said no, technically we would have to just be all right with that. So reaching out to local governments and local communities, whether it's government or just people who have a bit more power or a little more, um, how do you say, a voice, you know, people that can kind of direct the flow. Um, it sounds like bribery, but it's not. I'm not, you know, what I'm trying to say is we want to, we want to work with whoever is willing to tackle these problems. And it, one, one is to make sure that it's financially viable, but one is also with those finances to make sure that it's following the dreams, uh, the, the vision and mission, right? So we have to actually do the action to what we'd want to do and, or say we do. Um, and so that they're definitely collaborating with people that are either already in these um, Pro projects, whether it's waste, whether it's farming, whether it's community. Uh, yeah, we're definitely going to reach out to more of them soon. And we, we are, as in, we, we have a lot of, for example, Sungai Watch and other NGOs that are doing such epic jobs, we can't just reach out straight away when we're not ready. So we've been really holding our cards to be sure that when we do reach out, it's like, that's, that's where the handshake's going to go, and that's where we're really going to do things together. Um, rather than fast, it's more just taking the right steps at the time. So, Man, so Brother Lenny. Lenny's Len, like chilling out over here. He's, he's, he's kind of like falling back. Like, you know, except it, there's no back on his chairs for a reason. <laughs> he's like, oh, but you got, you, he, this guy here, really I love push. it. German efficiency is like, yeah, but Rob, I got the side here, man. What's up? <laughs> The, the side is better than the back. I got, <laughs> I got it covered. So, Lenny, the question is, you know, strategic partnerships, or better still, because you mentioned before, dunk, you know, like context in local government, right? This is more of the serious stuff. So, so who ideally would you love to see either inside the business or as a person or an entity organization outside the business that can facilitate you to do more, right? Who do, what do you need? Because people watching, right, who have got answers. So I'm a big believer in reaching out. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone in that whole environment is watching right now. <laughs> but Listen, you never know, brother. Let, let, let's hope, let's hope, let's hope. Don't assume, brother. <laughs> I mean, so what? One of the things that Juga touched on earlier was, you know, the, the age of farmers. I think that that's happening all over the world. It's not just Bali, um, but you know, if that's let's say, let's say, you know, the average farmer Bali is 60 years old. We're thinking 20 years ahead. No younger people are coming, coming, you know, following those um, footsteps. But everybody's eating, 
where's the food coming from? And so one of the things that we want to do is inspire and give an example to younger people, especially, you know, Balinese, Indonesian, um, you know, teenagers, kids, I think there's no, no age too early, to be exposed and to the importance of growing food, how to do it, um, why it's important to preserve nature. And so I think one of the big, big challenges, or, you know, what I would be really happy about is if we would have more connections to local schools. So getting in touch with local schools and saying, hey, we have this curriculum that we'd love to, you know, involve or like integrate into your curriculum that you have, and we'd love to have, you know, these classes spend at least an hour or two hours a week at the garden here, be exposed, get their hands dirty, really learn about the importance of doing all this, and obviously then take them to our other strategic partners that are implementing similar things to what we do all over Bali. But really, I think there's no point too early in, in someone's life to really get them in touch with, um, yeah, in the end, what we all depend on. I think people don't really think about it. You know, food is always there. Food is always in the supermarket. Food is, food is always at the, uh, you know, at the local market that you go to. But, you know, it's, it's not getting easier to grow it. It's actually getting harder. And so we have to do something to really rebuild soil. I know Rob here in the audience, he always says, you know, hey, guys, let's build soil. So props, props to that. Rob, great name, brother. <laughs> But yeah, so you know something special about you. <laughs> and I think the more the more kids, the more youngsters, teenagers understand that the importance of building soil, of how to do it, and that it's not just a dirty, you know, shitty paid job, but there actually can be a business model behind that that can sustain you even if there's no tourism around, then I think we're making a massive impact. And until now that's been on the back burner just because we, you know, we've, there's so much to set up in terms of operations and all that, but you know, we've started to teach at least at the international schools, which obviously is also one of our markets, but I think especially getting into the side of local schools is going to have the bigger impact on, you know, a bigger scale. All right. Thank you. I also want to thank you because we're not over, um, but, but you're the one who brought us together. You're the one who reached out. I think I reached out to you, was it? Anyway. Chloe. Chloe, there you go. <laughs> Chloe, that's right. So Chloe, round of applause for Chloe, right? Put it together. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, so Chloe reached out to me and said, these guys are pretty cool. I reckon you should get them on the show. Then I reached out to you, and it took us a little bit of a while, and then said, hey, why don't you do all three? I was like, why not? So that's really cool. But I want to pull you up on something, right? And it's with love. It's with love. So all I want to say is don't underestimate anything because, all right, for example, so tonight you have one guy in the audience, not, not Jerome, uh, though he's one other, but Adrian, right, who is an impact, like investors I mentioned before, impact, impact entrepreneur, let me get it right, who specializes in this stuff. That's one. This is a 202nd episode of Speak Up Monday. I'll, I'll mention three people, right? So one is Effie from Saba Bay, right? So Saba Bay is a winery, as you know. What they're doing is exactly what you're doing. They want to empower the next generation of farmer because they know it's not hip or cool anymore to be a farmer. So, so they're doing, again, I've been on a tour with her and da, 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 but they're doing, they're on the same mission, right? That's one person that is a possible partnership. There's another one um, who is, uh, I won't mention his name. Some people here will know him. He's a very significant business guy here in Bali. Very, very, very significant. He is uh, um, Balinese Chinese, okay? And he is on a mission to help farmers, to help fishermen, and all, all of those, right? And I'm going to try and connect you, right? And uh, he's a significant business owner, right? Very smart guy, but he's local. And there's one other person who, who was there and then disappeared, but will come back to me. So what I'm saying is like, um, and I know you were saying it's a flippant comment as well, but, um, but yeah, brother. Like, yeah, it's just provocative. Yeah, provocative. Well. Damn it, you got me. Oh, it worked. But yeah, brother, like there's some really good people out there. And, and like this, this is what I love doing, right? I love connecting people. Like, okay, sorry to take so long, but whatever. Three things I live by. One is facilitate. Mm -hmm. So I'm here to facilitate. Two is to inspire, right? And three is to connect. That's people between people and people with themselves. 
So being a, f a coach, speaker, like these are the things that I love. This is my contribution. Right, so so yeah, I, I'm. I love having you guys here. Like as soon as we sat down, as soon as you came in, I was like, these guys are cool. Well, I kind of knew that already because Chloe wouldn't put you forward unless you weren't cool. Um, but it's beautiful, man. It's really cool to have have you here. Oh, now, awesome. Question come up for you. So, what is the reason why you do this? Because I because I I get your passion. I get your passion, but I haven't got yours yet. Where it comes from. So where does your passion come from? If I ask you that, giving you time to think, if I asked you, right, um, you know, like, where does your driving force and passion for what you're doing come from? What would you say? I want to know too. <laughs> Money. <laughs> um, so I knew it. <laughs> I think, I mean, so let's, let's start with passion, passion for food. I think looking back at where I'm coming from, you know, as a kid, I didn't really enjoy it, but I always had, you know, we had a legit little vegetable garden at home, and, you know, I had to help my mom get the potatoes out of the soil with a fork, and, you know, water the tomatoes every morning before going to school. You hate it, right? As a kid, you, that's not what you, want time, what you want to spend your time on. But I see how, like, as soon as I got back in touch with that, you know, when getting out of university, moving to Bali, and like really just getting more in touch with the soil, there's so much of that coming back. And I think that's why I'm so convinced that exposing kids at young age to that is gonna have a, a positive impact. Doesn't have to, they don't have to be farmers at the age of 14, but if they can, you know, if they understand and they have, have this connection to the land, I think it's gonna come back at some point. And I think if they can turn that into something that they then spend their time on, that's gonna have an amazing impact. And so that's the passion, I think. I mean, I, I love eating, I love cooking, like there's a few things around that. But I think a passion around just wanting to do something with yeah, something, something positive, something that does have impact, not just you know on soil, or whatever, but um, on on people, on people around me, on people that I might not be in touch with. And I've had a conversation the other week about this, and I don't think it's coming from a place of guilt, but I think it's coming from a place of where I'm aware of you know the privileges and the advantages that I was born into. And wanting to take part of that, and wanting to take you know part of my time, part of my energy that I have every single day, in creating something that's not just great for myself, but does great for other people as well. Love it, love it, brother. You know, and love it. You know, like so. For those of you sitting there, being here is a bit different, right? So, <laughs> even if you've done lots of interviews before, like the thing is, is that like sometimes people ask, so. What are the questions? What are you going to ask me? What is it about? And I say to them, there's nothing to prepare. There's no questions that I can give you. It just come and we go and flow. Now, for some people, that's like, oh, <laughs> alert, danger, 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 right? But it's not, it's not easy when, when like, you're there thinking, like, well, what question is going to come next? Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. And then you get a mental block. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Mental block. <laughs> it's like breathe into your stomach, relax. Silence is actually necessary. It's your friend, not your foe. But it's hard to get there sometimes when you're not used to it or whatever. You're not, you're not comfortable being uncomfortable, right? So I just want to acknowledge each one of you because, like, I've, I get, and everyone here does as well, like a sense of who you are individually and how you fit together which is really powerful because anyone who's investing in people, it's always a team of people who are long-termers, right? Who are not there because it's called cool to be into, into sustainability right now. They're there because they have a passion, they have a drive, and they're there for the long term, and that's what people can get. The reason why I click my finger is because I realized who the third person was. So next week or the week after, a, a good friend, we haven't really connected properly on this show, Lana Reese. Lana, if you're watching, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. She is the founder of Pro Education. Pro Education is an incredible international school in Umalas. Pro Ed. Go and check them out. So she's on the show. I think it's next week or the week after, if my memory serves me correctly. Beautiful woman. Very driven. <laughs> Mamma mia. But she's amazing. And Pro Ed is a, is a crazy school. Like, she's, yeah. You're like, so I will definitely connect you guys. Again, I don't control the outcome. What I can do is all I can do, which is connect, and then whatever happens from there. But 
for me, knowing her a little, a little bit that I do, it will be something that she'll be interested in doing because it, it is a school like Montessori in the sense of it's not the same, but it's an alternate model, um, which is connecting kids to nature and all of that, I'm sure, will be part of her curriculum. So uh, that's three, three people, right? Four, including Adrian. Um, okay, so what's, what's the next question? Oh! <laughs> See that, that thing about silence before? No, no, no need searching. So, like, so, of the of what we've spoken about tonight, right? And by the way, after this, we'll go to you in the audience. So, if you have a question, in a few minutes, we're going to put this microphone around, and you can ask your question. But like, out of all the things that we discussed, what thing or things do you think so far is missing, if anything, from the conversation? In other words, is there something else that either of you? whether you have the microphone in your hand or not, would like to raise, would like to bring up. It's a good point. I mean, you never really ask what we disagree about, right? Yeah. So... What's missing? Yeah, what's missing, right? Because, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm the... the I'm in charge of the local connections. So when it comes to the legal things or when I have to, G1 needs to do something, of course, Lenny and Juka come to me, right? Because, I mean, let's be real, right? If you're a white person going to a village office, it's not going to go well. So, try, so try, <laughs> try being black. <laughs> I didn't say that. I they, can't believe I just said that. No, but I mean the greatest Set thing about race relations back a hundred no, I mean, years. The greatest thing about Rob, 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 Rob's like, I can't believe you said that. No, no, Come but on, Rob. you know the, the greatest thing about Bali in terms of racism, it's it's not bad. Like, and I mean, when we see someone of color, it's more like, oh, it's so funny they're a different color, yeah. but there's no bad. And this is my personal opinion. There's no like negativity towards it, right? If we see someone who's dark skin, oh, they look so dark skin. It's like more of like dark skin, well, white they skin, they right? I haven't seen so many Westerners, white people. Right. Some, in some places, I haven't yeah. seen some Westerners, yeah. some white people, some darker skin people. So for them, I'm yeah. sure. So I mean, that's that's the best part about Bali, right? There's no there's no real racism, and honestly, I think the only time I, I felt racism was when I was in uh, Singapore. But it was so little, you couldn't even... Anyway, back to my point. So when it comes to, to legal stuff, I usually take care of it. So I uh, made the connection with the village chief, uh, made the, the connection with the village chief for Pererinan, and we're talking about you know, trying to make change, right? And we're trying to change the education system because the key is education. The only reason that I even know about composting or recycling is because I went to Sunrise School. And Sunrise School is not cheap. When you go to a local school for 100,000 a year, 100,000 a year, and you go to Sunrise School, back then my family paid maybe three to five million per month. It's a big difference. And that's where the problem is, is that education for, you know, the business of sustainability is a rich person's business because poor people just don't have the, the, the money about it. So back to my point, I truly believe where, I think where we disagree is how we get there, right? So we agree that education is the key, but how we get there is completely different. So. I'm quite, I would say, negative or realistic in the sense that I know the way our government thinks. And that's because my, my local friends are the people who show off who they met. So they meet the vice governor, they meet the governor. I'm actually helping somebody uh, do a presentation, teach them how to present, and she's gonna be hopefully the head of the Travel Agent Association of Bali. Which meets, which meets the governor. And, but these people just do not, they're, they're not the kind of people who connect with the environment the same way we do. But the only way, and this is you know, where I think this is important, if we show the business model makes money, good money for everybody, then the education will follow. 
And I think that's, that's where, you know, forget about the governor. If you want to influence the governor, you go to the vice governor. And then you cannot influence the vice governor if you don't go to the head of the Kabupaten. And you cannot do that if you cannot influence your village chief. It's been one year, and neither village chiefs has gone to Jiwa yet. One of them went to my marriage last week, but they would never go to Jiwa. It's just out of their roadmap. And I'm hopefully they're not going to be listening, but the only reason that they came to, to, my, to my wedding is because I paid for the pachalang. You know? They came so fast. They came so fast. You have no idea how they came so fast. But to, a, to the Jiwa Garden, I don't know how, unless, unless we, shum, we somehow get pachalang for an event there. They'll be there so fast. Okay. If we have an event and we can afford to have pachalang for that event, you know it. So that's 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 how I, yeah. <laughs> man, so fast. Cr Cr Krishna, you're one inspiring man, for real, because you tell it how it is. And like none of us, I don't think, sitting up here, could express it the way you do. So clearly, clinically, and in a way that we really see it, right? Beautiful, clarity, thank you, respect. So same question to, to you. What do you think what is, is missing? What do we disagree about? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I don't know if the question was disagree, but what was missing, right? What's lacking in our, in our, in our maybe in the trio or in Jiwa or maybe even widely in Bali. I think a little bit more honesty, commitment, maybe patience. Everything needs to be done fast, right? We already spoke about this, but we tend to see, I don't know how many of you um, have been focusing on the permaculture movement in Bali in the past 10 years. It's been a very flashy, trendy, you know, looking good, expensive. It had to be, you know, selling courses. So it wasn't a very grassroot local movement. It was an expensive Western movement. And permaculture isn't that. It's not, you know, permaculture uh, boasts about saving the environment and feeding people. And none of that can be done if it's $2,000 a course. So um, one of the things that I realized that was just insane was we're not doing any permaculture here. It's all just how to make more money faster without actually feeding people. So how do we make Jiwa do all that accessible to everyone? and making people understand that this doesn't take one year. This doesn't take, it, it needs time. Soil needs time. Every, everything needs time and it needs community. So we're, we're not lacking it. We might be lacking just a bit of it, but we need more of it. We definitely need more community. We need more patience. We need more understanding of, you know, the, the systems take time. There's a couple movies out there and documentaries about how long it takes for degraded land to actually become thriving. We're talking about 5, 10, 15 years. And it's so nice when everybody talks about it and, you know, takes Instagram photos about their farm because they have the money to do it fast, but that's a tiny percentage of people. So. Focusing on patience and actually going through with the whole process. It's, I, man, I hope more people can do that, and I hope more of us can do that. And you know, it's not a fast uh, fix, understanding that. Beautiful, brother. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. But Eleni, over to you. So the question is, is that, uh, you know, like, you, I, I'm trying to be serious. I, I, I look at Krishna and I've got this beaming, beautiful smile. Back, and it just, it's, it's in fact, I, I laugh anyway, man, but I don't need any help. I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to be serious here. And Krishna just keeps looking with those eyes and that face. I'm like, oh, man. Because we all have such different opinions. I know. Yeah, yeah. So we have different, different opinions. When Juka's saying patience, I'm like, no patience. We got to go. We got to go. You know, we got to go, go. Anyway. Brother Lenny, but they're All both right. true. So, so Lenny, uh, the, the question is, uh, you know, what do you think is missing? And remember, these questions are not about understanding the question specifically. It's about what it triggers within you. Well, I think initially you asked what's missing in this interview. Is that, <laughs> was that correct? That was the original. That's, that's yeah. what I mean. You guys so don't listen. Away. You These guys listen. don't listen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't, first, listen. <laughs> So much ego. It's they don't listen. In my head. They don't listen. Le Le Lenny listens. We just talk to him. So that's why we have Lenny. You know. That's why we need Lenny. 
<laughs> Love you, Lenny. Um, all right, so I was actually thinking about this before I came here. Um, I really, I really appreciate the, you know, the the open approach that you have to the interview, and you, you ask great questions. I think you do listen very attentively. So thank you for that. Thank you for having us. Um, but I was thinking about this before I came, and I was like, if if Rob is going to ask us this one question, I'm not sure we're going to have a very good answer. And so, you know, I kind of, I think we all kind of avoid being being vulnerable. But I'd like to put the question out there and see what we have to say. Do it. Cool. Um, think about this, Lenny. <laughs> Don't think about it. Just do it. And so, I think so. One of the things we've been, you know, GWAS is not something that we do full time. We have, you know, other things going on. And so, I think we've been so busy running a race of, you know, trying to set everything up and get operations going. And I think we've reached a few points earlier than we. We expect it to, which is which is amazing in itself. But I think we've kind of, you know, lost or like not lost, but we were not super clear on where exactly I think we're going. And so if you would have asked me today, hey, where do you see yourself in three years and in five years? Yeah. What's that role matter like? Question. I don't have a very I don't have a very prepared answer. Yeah. But I'd like to explore it just for a second, maybe. I love, I love the honesty, man. I, I really do. And, and like, you know. I'm going to pass the mic on. Yeah, pass, pass <laughs> it on. I love the honesty. And while Christian's thinking of an answer, um, I, I love the honesty. But here's the thing. So earlier on, when I said to you, you know, like, you know, what types of strategic partnerships or people do you, do you need? And you mentioned about a business person, right? It's great because you actually know what it is that you need. But maybe you haven't expressed it. And tonight, there's one guy who might be able to help. Don't want to put any more pressure on him. Adrian <laughs> Keat, right? Um, who's, who's brilliant at this. And, and like someone who can sit down with you and just tease it out and say, okay, how about we put these in place? You know, because again, the three of you have a very specific skill set that even though you disagree, quoting Obama, I love that, right? You have different people in your cabinet that don't all agree. You don't want yes men. You want people who have a different opinion, who are able to express it to you in such a way it makes you think. And whichever answer you come out with, you know it's been well-reasoned. So the chances are you will get a solution, right? Better than just you going in your head, oh, this is right, I'm doing it, right? So I think it's brilliant that you ask that question and in a way, you've already put it out there, and I love that. So, yeah. Brother Krish, over to you. How would you ans answer the question that Lenny posed about where do you see yourself in three to five years' time? Where do you see Jiwa mm -hmm. in three to five years' time? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good question because I've, I've had... Um, so, I tend to go faster, or I tend to like jump first and then see later. And uh, sometimes that, that causes a bit of conflict, right? So I'll, I'll create something and then Juka will be like, oh, you should have waited. And then Lenny's like, ah, oh, you should have like asked to talk to us about it first. I was like, no, we got to go, we got to go. So that's, that's, I would say, my weakness. My weakness is I'm quite impatient. And I'm, I may be in the wrong industry because plants take a long time to grow. I'm like, you know, you know, you know I think the first time I learned that a, like an avocado tree takes five years to grow, I was like, five years? That's a long time. So I truly believe that the core principles of Jiwa, which is for waste, to find a solution for waste, which, by the way, is Jiwa is pretty unique. There's not many facilities that utilize animals to help with their composting, or utilize uh, food waste from the market. It's, I'm sure it's been done, but we haven't seen a composting facility that uses that. Mm -hmm. The biggest ones that, that I know use machinery and humans, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we're devaluing animals. Animals do it for free, and they're happy to do it. Honestly, like humans have to be paid. I mean, who wants to, you know, who wants to pay salaries? You know? This is where we, we right? no. I mean that in the best way possible. I'm, I'm mean, looking. I'm looking at the business model right now. <laughs> if an animal will do it for free and will be happy to do it, you know, we should start valuing animals better. Mm. You know, chickens, ducks, they just love it. So. Cows. Yeah, cows. You know, you know. We we started with with catfish. We got 43 catfish just today. We just put in catfish, and we're gonna start feeding them some some food scraps also. So, 
I would say the core of GWA is there, right? Food waste or, or waste in general, including biomass, leaves and branches. Second one is employment during COVID. There's not many companies that will hire people. It's just really tough. But we're opening a new avenue. So people can be like, oh yeah, I can grow some, I can hire somebody to grow stuff. That's always gonna happen. And the last one is for people to start thinking clearly about what's the future of Bali. I'm hoping I'm gonna have a kid soon. I'm hoping, you know. And I'm hoping that kids want to go to school and be like, I wanna be the next farmer. Because there's a problem with the word farmer. When you say farmer in English, it sounds very neutral. You're thinking about this, this farmer who grows crops, but you say the word patani, in, in, which is the word for farmer in Bahasa, it's almost demeaning. It's almost like negative. Oh, oh you're a patani? Oh, you're, you're patani. Oh, you're patani, you know? Like low IQ, low salary, poor, patani. There's a problem with that. So I would say the core values of Jiwa are there, but what, what surrounds it is where we could always use some help. So this is where, you know, there's no time to waste. We gotta go, we gotta go. And Lenny is like, okay, find the, Lenny's a perfectionist, he's a perfectionist. I am the anti-perfectionist, you know. And Juka likes to observe nature first. I'm like, just go for it first. <laughs> but she was in my soul, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not a business, I'm a businessman, but yeah. Anyway. Love it, great question. To our disagreements here. Yeah. <laughs> Juka. Brother Juka, over to you and so then, then back to Lenny. In the future, in, in the near future, um, man, I, I really hope that it, 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 the ball, this engine, um, which I've experienced, started running uh, just you know, within the next, within the past year, we, we haven't even had one full year. This has only been 10 months now um, of, of work in the garden. And what I've seen, I mean, I've done this for many years. I've seen so many different projects, uh, foundations, companies doing all sorts of stuff. And I have never seen such an epic, like, flower born from such dirty soil. You know, like, this has been the most inspiring year for myself and people around me, I think, um, during the most ridiculous time. Like, mm. we're talking about the world came to a standstill and we just pushed down every wall. It was just like coming down. And so there was a moment where we had a bit of a break and, uh, you know, Lenny had to go back to Germany for a couple months. He was getting married. So there was just uh, so many other things on our plate and I got sick for many months. And I was like, yo, this is a very strong, pain because I couldn't keep that engine running. We, we saw that engine kind of come to a, a slight standstill. Like, it's such an amazing feeling and now we have to see, okay, now that we're all back, back on our feet, 100% back in action, how do we get that engine to start rolling again? And I know it's gonna happen. I know that with our um, commitment and our understanding and our own knowledge from all different aspects within the next three years, man, I really hope that we can start some kind of cooperative of farmers, of smart entrepreneurs, young, smart farming businesses, you know, like this would be the, the dream, you know, hopefully that young farmers aren't going to be like, oh, I just have to like get dirty and have a poor wage. No, a young farmer is a businessman. You run your farm as a business. You talk to other people as your business to another business. You don't look up at everybody else and they don't look down at you as a young farmer. So the, the point is to bring a sense of, you're, you're feeding the world. Yo, nobody eats without you. There's not even a question. It's like, mm. everybody needs you, yet you are the one that we look down at. This yeah. is just, something isn't right. So if we can get a community of farmers that are empowered, that are young, that are able to break boundaries, you know, we're talking about taking quite risky steps, and I work with a few of them already, and, um, I don't. I don't see. I don't see this uh, stopping. You know. I, I see the engine taking, mm. taking off. So I really hope that we can do that within the near future. You know. Yeah. Mamma mia! I, I just want to clap every time for, for every one of them. It's like I got no. Hold to the end, but I don't want to. Want to clap now? Love that, man. You are three beautiful men. Love it. Really cool. So, brother Lenny, over to you, my man. Yeah, the same question to yourself. And then we will go to questions, promise. Um, I'll, I'll try and make it short. Um, Don't try. No, 
I, I was just going to jump on the bandwagon with, with Juka there. Um, I think it's really about, yeah, if, you know, five years from now, if we can, because I was talking about systems change earlier, if we can be a contribution to that, that farmers, people that grow food, you know, take a few steps up on the ladder of power. I think that'll be that'll be incredible, and I think there's obviously five years is a long time, and I think in five years we can make that happen through you know cooperatives and really giving power you know to farmers and not just see them as suppliers of a certain raw material, but as you know an integral part to how we you know how we feed our bodies and value value that more, and I think you know really having farmers work together more and taking more ownership in, in what they do and the actual value that they provide, I think that's a key step to get there. And at the same time, I think I'm hoping that, you know, in, in three years from now, we have a model that is repli replicable. So we can approach other people that have pieces of land that are not being used, and we can give them an exact breakdown of, hey, this is the money that you need, this is the capital that you need, these are the people, this is the plan, you can turn this space into you know, A, B, or C, or D, depending on your budget, and that's what you get out of it. Wow. What a powerful contribution the three of you are. I mean, with your Patani um, comment, you know, you, brother, just spilling your heart over there with, with how you see it, you're just coming back with the, if we can systemize this and then replicate it. Brilliant, you know, um, really cool. So uh, everyone who's here, by the way, we're here every Monday, 6.30, till whenever, and uh, always from really special people. Uh, no interview is the same, right? The energy is always what it is, but it's always different. But it, it always goes deep. It always explores things that we really want to know, you know, and, and throws off the fact that inspiration is caught, not taught necessarily. Inspiration is caught, not taught. Last time, inspiration is caught, no. not necessarily taught. So, now does anyone have any questions? Just put your hand up. Great. So what we do, Juka, we'll take your microphone and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll let um, Ayu navigate it out. Right? Now, I know, listen, I didn't want to say that, right? But the only one with mud under their chair <laughs> is Juka. Everyone else is clean. Juka, Juka brought the mud. I didn't want to bring it up, but you, you, you pushed my hand. You forced my hand. I know. It's a he's a real deal. I love you, Juka, man. Juka, man, you're, you're, listen, man, you're, you are a legend. All, all three of you are. I, I love it. And thank you for the honesty. And just, uh, yeah, it's so important just to be transparent and, uh, and towards your heart, man, whatever that is, to speak your own truth, even if it may be different from others. Amen. That's, that's, cool, that's courage. That's courage. Okay. Let's go. Chloe. Hey, guys. Um, so, Lenny, you mentioned earlier about the supply chain and being more aware of, as a consumer, what, where you are buying your food from, or maybe it's, maybe it's restaurants, maybe it's when we're buying produce, lots of different things. So as an expat here, I've questioned that many times. Like, I know my options for buying produce are market, right, festive, Pepito, uh, Alive, Bali Buddha, all these, you know, then those are more expensive, but I'm like, is it, is there a, a local version of that? And the big food stalls where all the fruit looks the same, and I'm like, I, that must be, I'm not sure where that's from. So I'm wondering, is there resources to learn that type of information as a consumer, as someone who wants to buy fruits and vegetables for their own home, for my own consumption, and then also which restaurants we can be aware of are being are using well-sourced foods. And then if I know, Rob, your question earlier had been people wanting to come, I'm imagining lots of people are starting restaurants, right? how do they consider when they're setting up what it's going to cost them to set up a restaurant, how can they consider the ethical proper choices of suppliers as they are thinking of their business models to set up their business? Um, so I guess that's like a three-part question. So as a consumer, I want to know where I can buy the right veggies and fruits, um, where I can know more about these restaurants. I know typically the... Waiters, waitresses may not know where the fruit's coming from. Um, and then, yeah, maybe for, I'm not looking personally to set up a restaurant, but anyone who might be listening, considering that for their businesses. Um, so thank you all. 
Th great question. Thank you for that. And I know. <laughs> Maybe start a blog. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerome is really excited about this. I know. I'm, I'm sure you'd have. Maybe we can pass the microphone on to Jerome afterwards. I'm sure you'd have a few things to say as well. Um, obviously, so first question. We personally, we have a few contacts. If it's you know, mainly it's it's vegetables, it's produce. You know, we can directly link you to farmers who pr who produce that. And then obviously, there's a few platforms and organizations that already try to combine lots of those because it is hard to get everything that you need from one from one source. It's almost impossible. And so obviously supermarkets, you know, there's no, we're not trying to shame supermarkets. Supermarkets are amazing. We need supermarkets. They, they're doing the right thing. They're putting, you know, a thousand suppliers into the same space that usually wouldn't have the exposure to individual consumers ever. And so there's a few, there's a few platforms, you know, I'd, I'd like to stay away from actually naming names. I'm happy to have a conversation with you afterwards, but I don't want to exclude anyone. I don't want to, you know, praise anyone too high here, but you can definitely reach out to Jiwa Garden on Instagram, send us a message, like, hey, where can I get good veggies? We'll send you, we'll send you a list of, list of places. Um, and I think for restaurants, um, I actually don't have a good answer to that. Um, and I mean, I've seen myself, you know, faced with the same question when you go into a restaurant and, you know, it's really hard to find restaurants that, actually really only use um, organic produce or, you know, are really transparent about where the things are coming from because, uh, again, it's really difficult to get all your things from one source and if you go through retailers and wholesalers, sometimes they don't even know where it's coming from. Um, and so, you know, I think that's why there is something lacking in the market where we have more transparency and we're really looking at a marketplace that does exactly mention where it's coming from with, you know, 100% transparency. Um, and I think there's a few that are already out there, and you know I don't want to, I don't want to say that none of them are you know trying to do their best, but I think there's definitely room for improvement, and I'm keen to see you know technology support all of that. We're talking about blockchain and all that to really you know see where things are coming from and be able to trace that back to the source. Yeah. That'll be that'll be incredible. I don't know if you guys want to add anything. You want to mention any names? Maybe that's just my opinion, but. No, <laughs> There, there, is, there is a lack of production, uh, and that's why these m projects to bring more of these farmers about is so necessary, because like we're talking about, today there is this many farmers, tomorrow there is that many less, and, and, and so on. And so if we don't bring the next generation, your question will be forever <laughs> the equal, you know, we won't, we won't get an answer, so, um, so yeah. I think. Maybe Jerome, if you give the microphone to this gentleman over here. Uh, Jerome is a future Speak Up Monday man, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. And I'm sure he's got some great things to say. Uh, thank you, yeah. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Next year, yeah? Okay. Yep. Um, well, basically, I'm building uh, something. I'm cooking. I can't say too much now, but which will answer all your questions, so we can talk later if you want, uh, just after this, yeah? <laughs> Uh, but I just want to, what was my question, I, I love these guys, man, I mean, they're fantastic. And uh, we have all, of, all the fans who are here tonight, so it's good. Um, thanks, Rob, for bringing that. But uh, that's very important. Um, just to give you a few statistics, I was just rechecking re my figures, but Indonesia is losing, uh, between 2000, uh, 2004, and 2013, it has lost 5 million farmers, which is about 500,000 a year. It's gone down to today, roughly, or let's say 2015, the last statistics, 26 million. Yeah. So it's very little. It's gone from the 1970s, 60% of the population working agrarian farming to 28 today. But it's still very important. Again, you touched the main thing. What about, like in companies, it's called succession planning. <laughs> Nothing happens, you know, like if, if not young people go there, uh, it's not going to happen. We're going to all starve. And by 2063, there's no farmers in Indonesia anymore at this rate. So just, just to plan the picture. I was just checking that again to make sure I'm, I'm saying real things. And there's, that's a great article from Jakarta Post from last year. Anyway. So my question was on this. How are you guys, what are your plans? I'm very interested in making what Rob just next to me just left said, the other Rob, uh, making farming more sexy. How are you going to bring these young kids to do that? Because it's hard work and all that. And I have my ideas, but I love to listen to you guys. I'm an older guy too, you know, I'm an older generation. So uh, yeah, how, how do you see? Because we, that's the key thing. 
or what mm. what tools would you use? Mm. I think also Rob forgot his phone, so it's mine. Oh, it's your phone. Okay, it's fine. It's all good. I think at the end of this conversation, people will be like, Krishna's like the money hungry businessman, and then Juka is the nature lover, and Lenny is the positive guy. But honestly, that's 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 how I would say the solution is. It's it's really trying to, especially the the young people who just got married, you know, <laughs> to to a big portion of the you know to prioritize. I mean, do you know how many people got married in October? It's like that's crazy because they all delayed there because of COVID. I would say that would be the solution. Honestly, it's. To uh, marrying or what? No, no. <laughs> no, to, to think of saving the environment in terms of business as business opportunities. I agree with you. You know, I, I don't really have any comments about the food supply because I don't have the best solution in mind. I, I really don't. Um, I know I, what I do for my food is I have a, a housekeeper who does all my cooking. She goes to the local market. But... And I make sure she doesn't use any MSG in her food for my for what I eat. And she was at the local market. But in terms of organic food, I, I don't have the solution, right? I would say the solution would be to lease land to grow your own food on that piece of land. You can grow so much food in a hundred meters squared, it's crazy. It's 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 amazing how much food you can grow. How do you entice these young people to do that? Show them the money. Show them the money. Show them what is the point of building this huge hotel during COVID. There's no customers. Wouldn't it be better to do... We talk about business, you know, when you go to business school, you, you, go, you talk about diversity. You never put all your eggs in one basket. We should start applying that when you're, you're combining farming and, and hospitality together. If you have a whole piece of land, don't use it all for one hotel. Now, Jiwa is the perfect example. We have two main sections. One is gardening, and the other is venue, and you have the ballet, the ballet, and now we're building a room. School. Right? A school, right? So we split Jiwa and Hop in a way. During PPKM, during the lockdown, you cannot have any events. And so you focus on the gardening section. We focus on production. When PPKM is over, we can now legally have events. You focus on the event section. So in your events, you bring young people there and show yes. them? Yeah. So it goes hand in hand, but it, it shows that when you're running a business, no one said you have to use the whole space for one kind of business. Think about, I mean, like this is a great example. You have open space air, right? Now, I would say maybe more fruit trees, but that's, it's, a, it's a good start. I would say compared to other businesses, fully built, one whole huge building, full AC. I mean... Where is the economics of that? You're depending on people to stay and work there. But what if there's no customers? The costs go off the charts. And then you have to fire everybody because you can't afford to run your business. Anyway, but I probably went off topic. but No, 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 it's that. But it's, that's called social yeah. entrepreneurship, you know? Right. And that's where also uh, younger people today are more conscious. The millennials are obvious. They want to contribute. They want to do something good. Mm. But it's the start, which is hard to push them. Can I add something? Yeah, that, Juka, please. Just, no, touching on the topic of, like, we do have events. We, we are hosting events every two weeks or every month, depending on the season. And... Um, at these events, it is awesome to see that we have some nights, I swear to God, I'm looking at the crowd and it's just, I think mostly locals. Yeah. And that's a big step for Changu. I don't know how, how, you, how used to the events you guys are here in Changu, but there's very rarely an event where a lot of people go, where it's musical, where it's in, a, in, in Changu, where both uh, communities can come, the Western and the local, where the local is bigger and it's integrated and it's accepting everybody. And a lot of them are farmers. <laughs> and this is a huge thing. You know, you're inviting people that come from the mountain that drive down who grow food for us and in, are invited to an event for Changuians and hipsters and non and all of that. And I think as a young person, as a farmer, you don't just want to live alone in a shack in the mountain in the middle of nowhere 
and just forget about the world. You you are young. You are motivated. You are ambitious. You want to be part of the cool gang. You want to be part of a cool group. And art, music has such an impact to that. In fact, I think the biggest reason why young generation today even think about agriculture is quite possibly due to a couple musicians that have made Nav it. Navicula. Navicula, Nostras, Dialog di Nihari. There are some musicians, I'm saying names because they're so vital to this movement, they have managed to bring the local young, sorry, the young attention towards nature. You know, they're, they're bringing a spotlight to something that would never, you know, was possible before. So culture, music, events, nature, um, culture is, is a big one. You know, like, what I'm hearing just from what you said before and what we discussed tonight is that this is a multi-dimensional, multi-layered approach consisting of, right? So you've got fear and you've got love because I'm, I'm a lover, right? I'm a lover, right? But most people are shifted by fear. Let's be honest. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's just how the world works. You've got this company called Monsanto that I'm sure just about everybody here has heard of, right? So there's a fear part to this, that our food supply is being, uh, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but that our food supply is being compromised, okay? So having the opportunity to, to grow something that as nature intended it, without being genetically modified for us, fear, right? can be used. Uh, another thing which, which comes up is that, so I, I got friends in the UK, right? Um, coldest, coldest, most miserable place on earth, sometimes, sometimes, during winter. And they're so um, enamored by and proud of themselves because they've got this little garden window at their window, right, where they grow some herbs and some spices and they've got like, I remember they were telling me one time, it's like, oh, look, you know, we're going to have this meal and all the spices I, I grew myself, <laughs> right? So it's this ego coming out, like, I did this myself. You had, you know, the farm to table concept, right, which you can phrase, frame in events. So Adrian Reed, Tropicola, Mexicola, Da Maria, he, he, great guy. Like, he had a concept, maybe, yeah, I can tell you. So, you know, part of what it was on his land was having a farm to table concept because people know if I eat something fresh, it's better for me. Right? So there's a way, and he's going to work with some local universities and so on to do it there and to make it a spectacle. So you've got your co working, you've got your technology on one side, then on the other side, you've got nature fusing together. So those sorts of events, those sorts of initiatives can make it cool. Um, one of the other things is that, you know, maybe cool is not the right word, even though I used it. It may be just how can we not, yeah, how can we convince? people that this is important it could be another way to go through it and there's so much information statistics um, which, which are happening right now to push us in the direction of we all know right as you said before right <laughs> when I go to the supermarket right like what, what think of the supply chain when I buy this thing think of the supply chain that one thing actually stuck with me and I'm like fuck that's right Think of the supply chain. So I think what it is, is it's a multi-layered, multi-dimensional approach of education, which is happening slowly. Fear, fear is a very powerful driver. Sorry, but it's true. Love, so, you, so we're, we're, we're repelled by fear as human beings, and we're kind of drawn to love, right? So you use this. And then you've got, as you mentioned, some of these celebrities, musicians, and so on, which are making it cool to be that. And then you've got people like, you know, Effie, the guys from Saba Bay, right? They've got a big business, right? And they really care about the farmers. This other business person, that I won't mention his name, fuck, this guy loves it. Like, he, like, I was very surprised. I thought that he might be, knowing the businesses that he owns, I thought he might be an asshole. I'll be honest, all right? I, I thought this guy might be a bit of an asshole. But he's the most beautiful, genuine guy who really wants to do the best for Bali and his people, especially farmers and fishermen and so on, like really, like boom. And he has, this we're giving it away, he has, let's say, outlets that could use this sort of produce. I'm gonna say no more than that, right? But I'll connect you happily. And so I think, again, it's a multi-layered, multi-dimensional approach which plays upon people's fear, sorry, but it's true, um, preys upon um, the fact that they, in our hearts, we know that what is the right thing to do and what isn't necessarily the best thing to do, right? I'm talking about Westerners, 
right? Locals, what, what Mare is doing, Janur and those guys, with changing people's um, habits. You know, before I, I just throw this over here, now this habit, if I do it a hundred times, I remember. If I do it a thousand times, it's part of my memory inbred. If I do it 10,000 times, it's muscle memory. So now instead of throwing it away, I separate it and I sort it from organic into inorganic waste. Right, so just again, it takes time. Uh, Go fast, but it takes time. Right? Or it takes the time that it takes. Right? Go faster, go faster, man. And I feel you too. Right? So, so I think, again, last time, it is a multi-dimensional, multi-layered approach, which, which last thing, and that's why um, strategic partnerships are so important, because we all have different skill sets. Maybe my skill set is you know, facilitating and asking questions and connecting people. Someone else pointing over there, right? I won't mention his name. Right, might be, well, how do we bring all of this together in a way? I remember last week he was talking about, you know, when it comes to consulting, it's, you know, what is it? Storming, norming, and forming, forming. Yeah, forming, storming, norming, and then performing. There you go. Forming. Love it, right? These are the four um, stages, right? When he consults, these are the four stages that he has to go through, and he wants to get through them as fast as possible, fast speed, fast as possible to get to the performing stage, right? So again, like there's enough people on this island, and I've met, well, 200 of them maybe, but uh, maybe a bit less, which are doing some amazing things, right? And it's, you know, the guys from Rainforest Pavilion, another guy, Alex, uh, Halim Adi, all of these guys, which you may or may not know, are doing some phenomenal things. Um, you know, the guys from Bali Design Center, another incredible guy, like, fuck, they are getting goose pimples. Like, phenomenal people doing outrageous things, but you need the outrageous people to push the envelope and then, you know, like it's, what is it? The pioneers get the arrows. <laughs> and then the early adopters get the pasture. Woo! You know, hey, where we? <laughs> look at all those guys at the front with the arrow in them. You know, it's like, let's just move them aside and walk straight on in. You know what I mean? So, so I see you guys as, as pioneers in many ways without arrows. And, and <laughs> without the arrows. Jerome, I'm being kind, man. Come on. I, I, I don't tell them they're going to die. Okay, the arrows don't hurt. <laughs> They don't, they're not the ones that pierce, oh, they're the ones that stick. <laughs> they don't pierce, they stick. So, so yeah, so, so these are the things, you know, and again, I had no idea where tonight was going. I never do. I follow the energy through and what comes, comes through us. Through us. Not from us, but through us. So I've loved this conversation. And uh, anyway, any other, any, not anyway as a throwaway, but, but anyway as in I return to the audience. Is there any other questions? Adrian has one. Yep. You have the microphone. Hey, if you're holding it, man, you've got a microphone. It's like bidding. <laughs> yeah, um, probably not a question, but some advice. Um, Lenny, you, you remember, I think, you, Juka, you were there as well. I brought my son to uh, a cafe, and they were talking about, uh, you know, the farming and how to get the younger generation involved. And uh, I feel like... Um, I think the, the target audience that you need to really understand the psychology of our parents and the kids... That, that's, you know, because the parents will influence what the kids go on to be, and the kids need to see this as fun. So, you know, I think w we need, we shouldn't forget about the fun factor. It is fun. You know, when I bring the kids to Jiwa, they enjoy it, chasing the chickens, getting dirty and all that. So let's, um, let's not forget the fun factor. Um, on the business side, I wondered if you considered, um, you know, in technology, there's the concept of an incubator. Right, so you bring businesses in, you, you mentor them. But I think in terms of an agro, um, agro business, um, you could probably consider a, uh, yeah, an agro business nursery where you welcome people to come in and put forward business ideas you know, around waste management, agriculture, uh, organic uh, plant supply, you know, f food supply chain, and um, yeah, you know, create um, an ecosystem around that where people come and maybe have the the Jiwa Agri Business Awards and you know get businesses to to sponsor it, have a big prize, have a, you know a sponsorship, scholarships, etc. And um, yeah, make it a big event and open to yeah anyone in Bali. Um, so if you're open to that idea, I'd love to speak to you about it more. 
<laughs> I think I can speak for all of us. I think that's a, a vital part of progress in our in our near future. And I, I we work with a lot of other projects that do these things already, and it's been very successful. So I, I, I don't see why not 100%. Yeah. So, so what the guys are saying, Adrian, is that yes, they'll be <laughs> yes. welcome, they'll be happy to meet you and discuss further. Is that correct? Yeah. 100%. All right, because I just want to be clear on that, right? Um, the other thing that came up, I keep banging your, your, like, your like knee. There's uh, someone there going like, that guy, is he? Uh, <laughs> like, he can't stop touching his leg. Look, it's just here. Normally, I bang tables. So if we ever have a meeting, anybody here, if I bang the table, it's not a sign of like, what's he doing? I'm excited, right? I, I'm excitable um, in that way. <laughs> so make sure that make sure that the table is like solid. Right? Otherwise, things kind of go on. And it's like, how many glasses have I broken? Don't talk about it. Um, sorry, tropical nomad. I've broken a few glasses. <laughs> so what I was going to say is that there's another group um, who have been on Speak Up Monday. And without revealing all the project details of what they're doing, but they're creating uh, an organization that we barley wide. And in that, I don't want to give the answer, the, que the, the name, because that will give it away. But they are rewarding, creating a system to reward projects which are contributing to Bali. These guys are extremely well connected and extremely well financed. And they've been living here for a long time. So they've got the know-how, they've got the resources, and they've got the contacts to make it work. And I know that if he's watching now, they would love to meet you guys, you know, because what you do is incredibly contributive to what Bali is becoming. And I, and I know you said before, like, you know, you see a little grain of hope, grain of salt, grain of hope, right? And ideally we can, you know, a little seed, let's call it a seed, not a grain, let's call it a grain of seed. Let's call, it, let's call it a seed, right? Which again, you know, like what I love, it was Richard Harrington, uh, some way, I love this guy, but he calls us all like, we're like an acorn tree in an acorn seed. We're so in other words, get it right, we're an acorn tree in seed form. That's it. So what it is, is that we have the intelligence within us to become majestic, incredibly beautiful, and last for eons. But it's about um, that seed being placed in, pardon the pun, into fertile soil, right? That can support its growth. And if we can do that, then that seed can, can become who it was born to be, which is a majestic tree. So puns aside, like that's how I see what you're doing. You know, and, and it's interesting because you know, like the more that we do this, the more connections and interconnections I see. Speak up money never started off like this. I told you how it started, yeah. right? But as it's moved on and the tourism architect thing that I do about you know helping tourism boards and operators, which is you too, um, maximize inbound tourism, generate it and maximize it and create these connections and interconnections, like the more I see what we've done is a is like a is a directory of incredible people who don't know each other yet. But if they can come together, which I'm sure they can, because I know everyone who sat, everyone I sat with, I know their heart, because I feel it. And I know that everyone that we've interviewed pretty much has got a huge heart and who wants to do good things for Bali in a, in a spirit of contribution, right? So this is what it's kind of become. And you're an integral piece of that jigsaw puzzle, as is these guys, everybody here who's watching, you're part of that jigsaw piece as well to create this network of an incredible world we call Bali. So, so man, again, not, 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 not the end, but these things keep on coming. Love you guys. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. And I promise to stop talking now. I get passionate. Mind the table. Okay, but anyway, this is not a question. This is just like an appreciation. Uh, as a local, we have many life philosophies. We have, you mentioned Trihita Karana. We also have Trikaya Parisuda, Tatwamasi, a lot. And then Juka explained very well about to having something, knowing something, understand something. It's different. And then Krishna add to do something, to take action towards it. It's just a different story. And I think Jiwa, I should say thank you. Uh, thank you for executing everything about Tatwa Masi, everything about Trihita Karana. And one thing that I know Lenny say that Kebun adalah Jiwa, if you remember. 
I know that Lenny is the one that that's it. happiest kids in the world if he is on the farm. So I think yeah, keep doing good. I think the world or Bali needs more happy kids like you guys doing something they that they love to be more in touch with nature and I don't know, what is it? Get your dose of dirt. That's Get your dose of you. dirt. I love that. I love that. Mamma mia. Love it. <laughs> and, and you know, um, the Tatwa Masi is what the giver comes receiving, and the receiver is a giver. Um, maybe we'll go to you, my brother. Um, just to, I think it's a very powerful concept, or philosophy, get it right. Um, so if you could explain what Tatwa Masi means to everybody here. I don't know what that means, actually. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Back to oh, wait, wow. you. Know, you know what? I love your honesty. That's why you, that's why you brought it up. It's you, honey. Okay, so Tatwa Masi is like, you are me and I am you. So what I'm doing to you will happen back to me. So it's just, you know, eventually everything is connected. So if you do good, it comes back good. Something like that. That's awesome. But I just wanted to point out when you kept saying it's a multi-dimensional approach, it couldn't be otherwise. We're not talking about one problem, right? We're not talking about a business of juices and smoothie bowls where you can just focus on one small issue which is your blender we're talking about so many issues and awesome awesome solutions so there's no way that we can approach this problem with one direction and one box uh, solution it's just not ever going to come to a solution because there's just so many layers to it so multi multi layered is specifically because it's a multi layered problem right and that that's yeah i just wanted to emphasize on how important it is when you see people come with solutions that are just like this will fix everything it's a one one thing it's so simple you just do this it will fix everything it takes so much more than just one thing of course do something don't do nothing but at least be aware that it's a pretty massive team effort yeah so, so yeah i definitely agree with what you're saying the multi level uh, solution is because it's a very multi dimensional problem Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I remember what Krishna said earlier. Want to be the little Krishna, a dream to be petani. Mm. I am Indonesian, and I remember when I was a kid, I feel like nobody say I want to be petani. Yeah. Like, I want to be a pilot. I want to be doctor. That's a lot. But not, not I want to be a petani. So my question is, why become petani is cool? So to make people, oh, OK, I want to be petani. So. It, it's, it's important to, to, you know, to always adapt to the times, right? Uh, we're now in a COVID situation. And if we look at the Spanish flu, for the first three years, it was suffering. But the recovery was about six years. So what I mean by that, the only two things that I believe are growing right now as an industry is the health industry and the agricultural in industry. So cool can be, can be whatever is the situation. This is the moment that we make farming cool. Because the only industries that are actually growing right now is also agriculture and health, yes. but. Not many doctors here, I'm assuming. But the agricultural industry, is, it's there for the taking. So if we can, you know, for those who want to be hoteliers, forget about it. You're going to wait six years if you want to be that patient. But the way to do it is to like wake up, be like, you want to attack this industry? You got to do it now. If you wait next year, it's over. The big companies already take it. But if you start now, well, actually, you should have started last year with GWA. But the point is, the sooner the better. It's almost like Bitcoin. You got to go in earlier before the market. So, I mean, honestly, you, you, you want to build a hotel, a restaurant, which is amazing because Changu has so many r new restaurants every month. Like, where do you think the customers are going to come from? No customers for now. Like, geez. Yes. So I would say start thinking about business as cool and why start a business that's in a, in a declining industry tourism is going to come back in six years so while waiting 
why don't you start in an industry that's growing right now? So that's where I would come in. You yeah. know what? Before you go there, Ichi, sorry, brother. I'm going to bring you into this. Bring, come over, brother. Come over. Grab the mic next to your next to your own. So, uh, so just one thing I didn't say before was, and you said it earlier on, right? It's about the business because yes, you're still going to have people working doing the manual work, but the cool factor, let's call it that, is owning the business. And then Ichi, who's the the owner here at Tropical Nomad, is about to speak, and we talk about this a lot about how to. Uh, um, how to um, vertically integrate because it's about the finished product, right? And how you can um, amalgamate with the finished product to create a product that's worth more, that you can then charge more. And then it becomes very sexy because now you're making money, big money. So can you explain a little bit ab about that? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, <clears throat> before I talk about, um, about your question, I just want to say that, you know, um, I think we really need a, you know, um, role model. And um, thank you for being that spokesperson and taking up that burden, because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And then it's, uh, you know, you are able to bridge the, um, you know, many different worlds. And that's what we really need right now. So, um, yeah. You know, keep up good work, yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, tell us how we can support you guys too, yeah. Okay. And the um, I think um, the question was about how to value add and then how we can actually, yeah. So um, so we've been. Um, my wife is formulator um, of natural products. She also does um, uh, kombuchas and drinks and things like that. Um, and uh, so what we've been talking about is uh, how can we actually you know, help the uh, producers, so farmers and, you know, uh, small agribusiness owners, um, people who has a bit of a tiny land and producing whatever they can with that land, yeah. But the problem was always been that products does not get value added. And then in the end, sometimes the worst scenario is that those raw materials actually get exported, processed, value added, come back into the country. And that just makes totally no sense whatsoever, right? But there hasn't been any, you know, really the support to really empower the local, you know, communities to, to who are producing all their good products, but they just cannot have the, they haven't had the investments, they haven't had the, the knowledge transfers and the support from the government, support from the, um, the community and the people in the politics and everybody. So it's kind of standstill for decades, you know, it's been, it's something that we've been always trying to do, but it hasn't been done for decades in Indonesia. Everything is kind of standstill. So, yeah, we're trying to, um, we always brainstorm with Jerome here as well, um, with Rob, of course. Um, and then what we're talking about is like, yeah, how can we actually uh, empower those people? And let's make a businesses that can re really buy that those value-added products or empower those, you know, um, businesses so that they can also directly export, right? Mm. In that, we need many different um, skill sets. First, yes, we need the people to be able to, um, you know, go through incubations and, you know, raise the funding, get the support from uh, uh, business leaders mm. so that, you know, doors will open and they will be able to actually do what they're trying to do, right? Second part is that we also need to have, you know, you, you guys already mentioned that education part, knowledge transfer, you know, passion and um, uh, dedication is something that's, you know, uh, sometimes people have it, but it, it needs to be kindred. It needs to be continuation of, of um, you know, supplying that, that energy back. Otherwise, it's like, yeah, sometimes it just loses the momentum or, you know, the, the energy is not enough to really go through the, the um, difficult times and therefore, you know, many projects actually fail at the time, right? And then the third is the platform. I think it's that the, we are talking about um, globally about e-commerce market, which is growing like so rapidly. And then now everything is basically e-commerce. Mm. That's where everybody is um, um, making it right now. Um, and uh, the thing is that we haven't really tapped into that from, I don't know, from a Changu or mm. from Bali or even Indonesia. Mm. That much natural resources, agricultural products, so much potential, yet how come we don't have any platform that can actually find and then 
you know, provide that all the that the whole thing, take care of the export, take care of the all the um, red tapes and all that. You know, because that's really hindering that. You know, people who have vision, who wants to do it, who has a passion, but they cannot execute it because there's just so many obstacles, right? So many challenges. So that's what we really want to, you know, gather support, advice, and the, um, you know, trying to make it into a movement and then really support the young people, support the community, support the the, um, the producers, farmers, you know, all these people, so that they can come up to the equal playing field. You know, that's something I think we really have to to try hard. And um, yeah, so. Well, that's just my sharing, but uh, I think let's, you know, gather momentum, communities, let's support each other, and uh, yeah, I'm sure awesome. we can. Awesome. Yeah. Obviously, I love Ichime uh, for many reasons. Um, one thing we're going to do, I think we're probably getting close to, 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 to wrapping up. It's funny because you, you, I think you asked Ellen, how long, how long does it go for? <laughs> so, oh, an hour. An hour. <laughs> but I said, you know, however long it goes on for. Now, I know we've been going for a while, but it's needed. Yeah. Like the energy of it is I what takes that. us through. And, and we follow that. But, um, so but, but, yeah. but one thing that we're going to do, right, because for three years we've been doing this Speak Up Monday, right? Every Monday, I haven't missed a week. Episode 202, as I mentioned. But I think a way for us to really interact with the community is to create a mastermind dinner, like a series of them, kind of on a monthly thing, because the brains trusts that we have within these 200, whoever's here in Bali, like, but it's a lot of them, is phenomenal. And, and I've, I've attended a few masterminds. Gil Peter Sewell, if you're watching, Gil, it's like a mastermind freak. Well, he's an expert and he's amazing at what he does. He's one of my good mates. But, um, but I think that's what we're going to do, you know, where we can have a theme each, each month, maybe once a month, and then we can literally, you know, because, again, people like Itchy, Jerome, Adrian, ourselves, and everyone, everyone here is welcome to, you know, mastermind isn't coaching. Mastermind is a sharing, a collective response to a challenge or to find solutions that are not maybe within our, within our head, but somebody else has exactly what you need to hear, to create and stimulate your brain to create another solution that you can act upon now. Right and have results. So, so the more again, the more I listen to this, the more I'm getting this. Jerome, of you. Okay, so action plan. We start December or January about the mastermind. Which oh, one? I love you, man. Put me on the spot. November, yeah, you have to. November. Oh, you guys are shockers. Oh, far out. Let, let's yeah, let, let's shoot for December. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Done. All right, I'll let you know about it. Damn, well, I guess we're doing it. Good. So we're, we're doing it now. It's publicly announced. Oh, I'm doing it. We're doing it. Now, uh, maybe last question, Jerome. Did you ha yes, over here, my darling. Yeah, please. Not, however many questions there are, whatever, man. Sarah. Sorry. Sarah. Yeah, girl. Just one Sarah. last one. You three pretty much represent exactly the kind of impact that you're trying to have on people's lives and children's education and each of you come from different educations and backgrounds and you had certain frustrations throughout the way and certain things that propelled you along the way and then you found each other and you you were talking about your challenges mm. but there's something about Jiwa Garden that really works and you guys are making it work and so I'm just wondering what do you think it is that is making you guys as successful as you are and like are there ways in these partnerships that you're forming or in the curriculum that you're developing like how how is that what you guys the magic that you three have being reflected in the programs that you're developing and the partnerships that you're forming wow. I'll just go first cuz I'll be quick so I I honestly think that Jiwa is is perfectly po positioned during for this moment right now you know the ways to to hire people who cannot find jobs and uh, to find a alternative to your traditional go-to hotel or to a restaurant. So that, that's where I would say we come in. Now, what I would like to happen is, or what I wish to happen, is for people to see what's happening and be like, oh, I want to get into that industry because now's the time. Next year, it's, o it's over. So I would like to see more people and you know, every time someone comes along and says, I want to do a garden like this, we always tell them, like, we'll give you some seeds. We're, we're passing on the, the same message that we received, which was, you know, one of the great projects in Bali is called Kabun Berdaya, and it's, it's five 
mini landfills around Denpasar converted to community gardens. Wow. You know? That's cool. It's amazing. And the first thing they said is, hey, if you're going to build a garden, we'll give you some seeds. And it's what they did. So we would like to extend the hand to anybody who wants to build a garden, a community. We'll give you some seeds. So that's, for me, I would say, GWA is perfectly p positioned right now for the current situation. And we wish to inspire more people. That's, yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, question. I guess, yeah, first of all, shout out to Kubun Berdaya for sure. They just inspired and again musically artistically community wise all of that i cannot I, I cannot have yeah imagined such an awesome project before this and it definitely helped uh, our uh, inspiration as well but going back to the question what what it is that makes us work i think i mean we're so different it's insane like sometimes i look at myself and i say you know, me and Chris, there's just nothing that we could ever, you know, the, from the day I was born to the, you know, to now, like how we managed to cross is kind of bizarre. And um, he's, he, you know, he's, his background is just complete polar opposite to mine. His approaches are so opposite. And so many times I find myself going like, I would have never done this that way. No, really, like never. Yet it worked better than if I did it my way, you know? It's, it's just the truth. And it's painful to accept sometimes, you know? Sometimes I'm like, yo, I can't believe that worked because I would have done it differently and it would have probably failed. And it's, and it's just the truth. Um, from the first day, he was like, yeah, we're going to start our morning briefings at 8. And I'm just like, fuck, <laughs> this is seriously going to happen? Like. No, please don't let this happen. And without these morning briefings, we have two a day, every morning and every afternoon, that there is no question about it. And um, and I'm sure there's so many times that they were like, yo, Juka, what the fuck are you doing? You're like, why are you doing this? And I'm sure that it also brought um, that that part to theirs, like the fact that we do things differently because of our backgrounds and because of of how, we, uh, how it clicks. Um, and again, multi-dimensional solutions, really. There's no way I could tackle all these problems. No way, not even close by myself. Um, and even three of us have a hard time sometimes tackling these issues. So the fact that we have such broad spectrums makes it that much more possible. Uh, and I, I salute uh, by far the partners I work with because it's, it's not easy. And so many times when I'm like, yo, I have no idea how to tackle this. Thank God I have two other tools, you know, that toolkits. So yeah, for sure. Lenny. Um, yes, I, I totally second that. Um, I think you were talking about, you know, bringing people together and kind of filling each other's gaps and really feeding from each other's, you know, skill sets. And I think it's, you know, we had no idea it's going to work out this way. And I think we've kind of found a way where we really, as they mentioned, we come from really different backgrounds. But I think the, the thing that we do have for each other is an incredible amount of respect. Um, for just the person, just as a human being, but also for what they bring to the table. And so I think what we've done well is to to listen, listen to each other, and like really hear each other out, and trust trust the other person. And when they're really trying to make a call on something, maybe more, you know, with more force than you know the other two. And I think we try to really listen to that and tune into that and see, okay, does this really make sense? And usually we've, yeah, we've seen that things do work out and we really stand up for what we want to do. Um, it really took us in the right direction. And I think it's this kind of trust in, trust in each other and really being, being able to, to rely on each other um, throughout these times has been a huge factor. And, you know, as I think making it, making it work and going back to Sarah's question, I think, you know, everybody that, that's sitting here, I think has been, and you know, an incredibly valuable contribution to making it work. Wow. And we know we're kind of we're kind of switching. A lot of the times, it's easier to refer to the project as Jiwa Garden. That's the Instagram and all that. But in the beginning, it was very consciously des decided that we call it Jiwa Community Garden mm -hmm. because the first time that we really put spades in the soil and it, you know did all of that and really started working was you know inviting everybody that we knew and like hey we're trying to do this thing we actually don't really know where it's going but we'd love to have everybody's input and see where it's taken us and you know when 60 70 people show up and put their heads together for an hour there's a lot of plans a lot of ideas coming out of that and mine. and yeah like we're literally we've, we've been putting on these you know jiwa garden sessions twice a month since i think february or january and so that's when people can just show up and 
and help us and actually get to work physically and that's moved us ahead incredibly. We do have our staff and they can, you know, they're doing incredible work. But, you know, having 30, 40 people from the community show up on a Saturday afternoon and just really getting their doors of dirt for about three hours, it's incredible what we've done with that. And um, I think we totally underestimated how fast we can move ahead with so much support. And um, I think really without those contributions and having a few very dedicated individuals putting ideas you know, on the table and really f having a sense of ownership in the project. And I think that's what really, what's really, you know, given us the speed and, you know, the pace at which we, we could work. And I think in the end, that's the idea of a community garden, having people that do f really feel part of it, really have a sense of ownership. And that's an energy that's really hard to slow down. Love it, love it man. Absolutely love it. You know, so, so look, if we don't have any more questions, we'll, we'll begin to wrap up. And so the way that we, that we wrap this up is that I, I, do, I do a monologue for about two minutes. And like, <laughs> then after that time, <laughs> you watch it, it's just like that. Uh, after that time, what we'll do, we'll go in reverse order, right? So we'll start with, with, with you, my brother, Juka. Then we we'll go dink, dink, dink. So the idea is that, um, you know, we finish with you the guests, right? And it's something that you want to say. Now, it might be reiterating something that you've said already. It might be something new that comes in that you feel is important to leave people with. It can be as long as you like, within reason, as, lo as, as long as you like or as short as you like. So just have a think on what that might be. So Juka, Brother Krish, and finishing with, with you, Brother Lenny, and in about two minutes' time, so you've got a little bit of time to think. So just want to thank um, Tropical Nomad. Um, again, this is number 200 and something, and uh, it's phenomenal because uh, you know, the first 50 or 60 were at Life in Bali, Tomorrow Gallery. Shout out to the Tomorrow Group. I've uh, been working with these guys for a very long time. Um, awesome people, uh, in, very innovative. And Tomorrow Gallery, Tomorrow, tomorrow Square, if you haven't been, got to come. Bit, bit, bit of a plug. Absolutely. Now, the last, and I think we did 40 or 50 that were when COVID struck and that was online. One, some were at Zin Rooftop. So thanks to Zin, because you're part of the legacy as well, Zin Rooftop. And then we went online to Google Meets, to Google Hangouts. That was, that was abysmal. <laughs> Sorry, Google Hangouts, but it wasn't a good experience. Then we went to Instagram Live and that was a killer. You're in and out of reception all the time. Oh. like, oh, man. And then finally found Itchy. Uh, a real tropical nomad, and we got along straight away. And uh, and he was like, "Look, Rob, why don't you think about doing it here?" And then it just made sense. And that was like a you know 103 episodes, 104 episodes ago. And I'm so glad that we did because we worked very closely together, not only on Speak Up Monday, but on this. What we're talking about really is this network for good, right? In Bali, that's trusted, that is able to connect all these different dots, or look at it like a big mosaic or a batik with a jigsaw puzzle, and we keep putting pieces in. No one controls it, but everyone is part of it that has that intention, right? And that's what we're doing in all directions. So it's destination Indonesia because it's about people who are here already in Bali or Indonesia, but those who are looking from overseas right now thinking like, hey, this Bali place looks all right, you know, but who do I speak to? Where do I go? <laughs> How do I find my people? This is what we're building, all right? So um, tomorrow is Speak Up Clubhouse, so it's 8 a.m., and tomorrow is Vanessa Seriano, who's, uh, this woman is incredibly powerful. And it's about uh, women's empowerment or female empowerment. And we go, we, we're going to go deep tomorrow morning. That's 8 a.m. our time, U.S. time, which is still mainly for the U.S. market, is 4 p.m. On the, on the West Coast and 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Just check the Speak Up Monday page. It's on there. Then Wednesday, we've got a, a replay of, uh, of, of a brother who was on, on the show much time ago. But just check our feeds. Join Speak Up Monday uh, on Facebook group, Speak Up One Word, Monday group, and obviously on Instagram and we've got a WhatsApp group as well. Okay, take a breath. Now, I want to thank the audience. Thank you guys for coming. Bye. Thank you so much, right? So, I love it. It's a live audience, right? And, and we, 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 we want to, I mean, uh, Speak Up Monday, Life in Bali, we had up to 100 people. It was crazy every week. Um, so, what we're going to do is we'll build it back up again. So, if you're watching now, better to come live because then you get to meet everybody and you get to network. We're not network, such a, an overused word. You get to connect with people that, that have an incredible, um, 
part to play in your life without you realizing it. So that's why you should come watch it live. Come at 6 o'clock on Monday. So we start at 6.30. Don't come at 6.30 because you're always late, you guys. <laughs> come at 6 o'clock. And then finally, um, so who we got? We've got Ichi, we've got Guzman, we've got Bella, Brother Ayub Thank over you. there. Thank you guys for making this happen. Appreciate it. Woo. Now, finally, to you beautiful, beautiful men over here. Man, as we said before, like we don't follow any format or formula. We don't write shit down. We just go in, we allow, and whatever, and it comes through us. And like the more we do this, the more I realize how important and valuable it is. And what you've shared individually and as a collective is inspiring, man. And the people who are here or the people who will watch this in the future, who are watching it now as well, I am sure will be inspired to do and to move, right, in a way that starts their own ball rolling, which is part of a greater journey. So just Juga, <laughs> but Krishna, and but Lenny, thank you so so much for being part of this and being game to do it. And thanks for coming and showing my kids uh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. oh, those kids. Oh, we've got, we got, we got a way to go with them. To my go. beautiful girl, Marina, we're laughing about it. It's like, yeah, we have a way to go with our children. <laughs> but that's okay. We're getting there. So, again, so we're going to pass it on, reverse order, and just a closing comment or comment, something that is important for you that you think should leave people with. Remember, Lenny, to give yourselves a plug on where people can find you. All that stuff. Okay. Thanks, guys. Over to you. Oh, God. I guess to start with, of course, this is what, what we should be doing. We should obviously be connecting more. We should be reaching out more. Sometimes we do tend to forget. We're all on our missions, and our missions are so, like, so we tend to forget that right here there's a friend and a fellow and a, you know, possible uh, epic partnership. So it's it's it tends to get hard to look around. But... That's, I guess, a call for action as well. Um, and I don't know. For me, obviously, I can relate to Bali. I grew up here. I saw it develop into what it is today. And it was, it, it was the most painful thing to see as, as a kid. Um, to have to accept, I, just, I didn't want to accept it. I just don't, don't want to accept that this is what Bali is becoming. It is becoming a fucking dump. You know, this is what I thought it was as a kid. I'm like, yo, I'm looking at everything just collapse. All the rice fields are gone. All the forests are being uh, destroyed. So it was a very terrible feeling as a teenager. And and then I saw Changu develop. And then uh, myself, I ran a hostel for six years. And all I was trying to get to was just get travelers to see that Bali has obviously a history. It, it has an insane history. And not to take away, every other place has a history too. And wherever, wherever you come from, you should be doing that at home. You should be doing these types of things at home, caring a little more about your environment, caring about your community, and not let it go to complete shit before it's too late. And it's tough to have to, you know, ask people to even pay attention to this stuff, you know? So if you do come to Bali, if you do live in Bali, if you are not local, if you are local, wherever you're from, just get a little more involved in your local network, in your community. No, man, it's it doesn't have to be this cheesy, ultra-spiritual awakening. It's just basic humans doing really cool things, having a good time, and learning from each other, and supporting each other. Um, gardening is not you know, hippie, they're feeding the whole fucking world, you know. This is not a hippie movement. It was started, you know, permaculture started from real farmers with real solutions. So get get more involved in what na uh, nature has to offer and is, you know, get rid of these stereotypical thoughts and reach out to, to your local community a little more. So yeah, that's, I hope, what we can get uh, out of this and passing it out. COVID sucks, I guess that's, that's, <laughs> no, no, that's a, no, it's a good point. I mean, uh, yeah, for, for me, my, my last word would be, yeah, you know, when COVID happened, uh, th there's nothing that you can, uh, can explain what, what's, what's happening. What's happening is something is happening glo globally and you cannot change that. I remember the first time that we had to let go of, of employees. We used to have 120 employees. Now we have 30. 
I remember there was an, a day I came home from work and I realized I did all the financial calculations, I did all the estimates. I knew this was the last month that we could hire them and there was nothing I could do. And it was the first day I, I broke down. I, I went home and I just cried like a baby. Um, but that's over now. And we have to accept that, that this, this is the new reality. And it's only, honestly, two industries right now that can grow. It's health and agriculture. So if you don't care about the environment or it's not a priority, that's OK. Right now, the agricultural industry is the biggest game changer. So for all the young people, all the people who are looking for a job or a career, instead of thinking about the next big hotel or the big restaurant, why not think about the next greatest agricultural company or the greatest education center for agriculture? Think about that. If, if money is always a priority, and I would agree with that too, but let's do it while saving the environment. Because in the end, we're all entrepreneurs. Or if you're not, then I know we all wish you want to be one. <laughs> and, and right now, to be an entrepreneur, the best opportunity is in agriculture. To be a farmer, to be a patani. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, just on, find us on Instagram, Jiwagon, that's it. Like, 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 like we faded out, so we're not done. So, all good. So, Lenny, over to you, brother. Uh, cool. Um, I would like to, I'd like to just share um, a bit of a personal journey that I've been through with, with this whole project. And I think the message that I'd like to yeah, communicate to, other, to everybody listening, anybody who was ever going to hear this, anybody who was here, um, if if you find something, and even if it's just the, the tiniest spark of yeah, passion, of something that really inspires you, it's 100% worth pursuing, even if it's really scary, it's really fucking hard at times, but really what's important is go and persevere. Really go with it, really put your heart into it. And even if you feel rejection, if you have the spark, just know it's 100% worth it. And for me, you know, this is this is kind of how also this entire project for me started off, and I really had to overcome my own, you know, ego, my own my own uh, values, and really be like, no, I really, I think this is something that I really want to be part of, and so let me go and do that, and really put all of myself on on the line, and it's been the most, yeah, fulfilling and you know, gratifying journey. So I'm. Super, super grateful that that happened, and I'd like to, you know, pass it on to everyone who's listening or whoever has something that they feel like they'd like to pursue, but feel like something is holding them back, or they're not good enough, they're f afraid of something, they feel like, you know, other people are trying to hold them back. Just really fucking go for it, and it's going to be epic. Love it. Where is Jiwa Garden? How do people get in touch? Yeah. Okay, so Jiwa Garden is. 10 minutes from the center of Changu, um, and you can find us on Google Maps, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Jiwa Garden. And obviously, you know, I think the best way to get in touch with us is just to come by, have a look at the garden, um, meet any of us there, meet the team, join one of our garden sessions that we have every first and every third Saturday of the month, 3 p.m. Or, you know, come by this week on Saturday, 27th, we'll have some live music from 5 p.m. on. That's a monthly get-together, just really cool souls creating good music. Did you have a flyer for it? We do have a flyer, I'll share it with you. Sure, yeah. 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 So, guys, um, that's it from us. Thank you so much. A round of applause. GY Garden, guys. <laughs> <laughs>